uh, I call that my Babylonian resume. And uh, my wife's actually back there, the most important part. Hi. <laughs> She's the pretty one. Yeah. The, the rest I have to repent of. Uh, my pra being a practitioner of the dark arts is not easy on your soul. Um, and, and the law truly is, at, or has become, the dark arts. Anybody uh, ever studied communism, the history of communism? Do you know when Karl Marx was born? 1818. You know when Joseph Smith was born? 1805. 13 years apart. That's an interesting thing because Karl Marx's life will parallel, in many ways, Joseph's life. They both will become editors of newspapers, uh, magazines. They both will be prolific writers who seem to transcend their earthly ability. One will write about theocracy. The other will write about uh, law and politics. And if you, you know, I'll do a quick little exercise with you. If you do a, if you open your scripture app and you go up into the search feature right up here, you can actually search for things by, uh, with great specificity. They've, they've taken away some of your ability to search. You used to be able to search with Boolean phrases in the Gospel Library app, and you can't really do that anymore. Uh, I'm not sure why they removed that, but you can still search with quotes. So you could punch in the word, you know, politic, and you could search that word and you'll get every hit for the word politic, politics, or political in the scriptures. And let's, we can narrow it down. And as soon as it's done searching, I probably need to connect to the internet so it's a little faster than this. Um, there it is, right there. So you've got one reference to politics in the chapter heading. It doesn't appear in the verse. You've got one reference to the word politics in uh, official declaration one, so it's not canon. <coughs> so what, what, what happens is the word politics never appears in scripture. Now the question becomes why? Why wouldn't the word politics appear in scripture? Because it's fundamentally important to all of our lives. And yet God never uses the word. So why? Now, um, if I, I don't have it today, but um, Joseph Smith will finish his great writings by about 1844 when he dies. Karl Marx will begin all of his great writing in about 1844. And one of his uh, most well-known books or essays, Karl Marx argues, that it is requisite for mankind to begin to speak in terms of law and politics rather than religion and theology. So if you could successfully transition people from speaking in terms of religion and theology to politics and law, what happens? By nature. You lose your spirituality. And you go from, you go from a notion of natural law and heavenly law to earthly determinism or positive law or relativistic law. And that was one of Karl Marx's objectives was to move the world into the realm of a conversation of politics and not theology. Until we get to today, where how often do you get to have a spiritual conversation in the types of learning that we have embraced as a people? You don't, it's illegal. You can have historical conversations about the place of different religions uh, within learning, but for the most part, we've eliminated uh, all spiritual learning in our institutions of government. And so we have fully realized Karl Marx's dream of transitioning from a state of theological and religious perspectives to a state of political and legal perspectives and the law embraces this. And so when you, when you realize that, it's a little hard to walk into a courtroom these days, especially after 2020, uh, when the court so fully embraced 
uh, the violations of our First Amendment rights that occurred in that time. Okay, a couple questions. How many of you, and you know, please don't be afraid to say no, because I really need to kind of know this to figure out how to talk to you tonight. How many of you have ever read anything by Jonathan Kahn? Who's never heard of Jonathan Kahn? Okay, how many of you have ever read Ezra's Eagle from 2nd Ezra's chapter 11 and 12? Who has never read it? Okay, um, how many of you attended the Palmyra Temple dedication in the year 2000? All right, how about, um, how many of you remember President Hinckley's talks in general conference after 9-11? Okay, and then how many of you are familiar with the Virgo sign in 2017? How many are not? Okay, all right, that's helpful. So if you have watched one of my videos and heard, they're, they're actually not mine, they're Jennifer's, so blame her. Um, if you have, I may be a little bit repetitive tonight. And knowing what we just went through there helps me to kind of focus what I'm about to say, because I have a tendency to feel like I've said things over and over, because I've done this about 200 times now, and I feel like I'm starting to repeat myself quite a bit. But I'll have people come up afterwards and say, and you really went fast, so fast through that that I just completely missed what you were saying. And so I don't want to do that. So please feel free to kind of slow me down and remind me that some of you have never heard any of this before. Now, one of the reasons I started this was because of kind of this moment in time. How many of you remember this? How many of you had friends or family members that were caused trouble by this event? I know people who went inactive because of this, lost their testimonies because of this. And from a legal perspective, Anybody get the most recent Liahona with the Easter message? Okay, if you were to go to the most recent Liahona message from the first presidency, it is by President Nelson. And at the very end of this article about Christ and, and the, the importance of the atonement and his mission, at the end of that Liahona article, you will see three large signatures by President Nelson, Dallin H. Oaks, and Henry B. Eyring. Now look at that letter right there. Notice anything missing? Three big signatures. Okay. Now there's also no legal salutation on this, which a lot of people would say, well, that's not, well, who cares? Legal salutations throughout history are actually quite important. We don't really use them anymore, but they used to have meaning, and a legal salutation would be something like sincerely. No signature, no sincerely. Okay. Now, let me clarify before I kind of jump into my presentation. I don't care what you did in response to this. It's none of my business. I am not your leader. I'm not even related to you. And so whatever inspiration and guidance you had in your life and whatever you did in relation to this, that's completely up to you. But I also had to take some people who were saying, I just can't, I can't do it anymore because I can't believe those guys issued this letter. I would say, well, what, what about this letter offends you? Well, they told everybody to go get vaccinated. Okay, could you show me where that is? Yeah, sure, it's in that letter. Well, let's read it real quick, okay, before we jump in and, and try to deal with the events of our day that seem to have been exacerbated by 2020 and the secret combination takeover of the world that happened in 2020. And I'll qualify that in a little bit. We find ourselves fighting a war against the ravages of COVID-19 and its variants, an unrelenting pandemic. Now, is there anything not true in that statement? That statement ends in a period. So that's the sentence right there. Was COVID-19 a pandemic? Did you know that Utah went into martial law, literally? So uh, um, some parents and I drafted a lawsuit against the state of Utah in 2020. I studied all the laws, and what happens when you invoke certain laws in the state of Utah 
under an emergency order, it triggers other statutes. And by triggering those statutes, it triggers the Constitution's martial law provisions. And in 2020, the state of Utah went into martial law. Now that's a pandemic. Even if you don't think it's a pandemic from a disease, it is a pandemic against liberty. If you declare martial law, liberty is gone. You don't have it. And one of the reasons that's important is because once martial law is triggered, a governor in a state that's under martial law can assume legislative functions and enter into binding contracts without any input, any accountability, and no transparency from the people. And that happened. Now, guess who we entered into a secret agreement with in 2020 under martial law? The Rockefeller Foundation, a pillar of morality and theology. <laughs> and we entered into an agreement with them to buy 500,000 rapid antigen tests, and nobody ever got to review that contract. It was done in secret. Now, there are a lot of problems with that. You're going to have to go down those rabbit holes yourself. If you want to write down this, I'm not going to go over it tonight, but study the solemn covenant of the states. It's a really fascinating rabbit hole to go down. Look at the concepts behind the solemn covenant of the states and how it manifested itself in other places uh, during COVID-19. Okay, let's go to the second sentence. We, we want to do all we can to limit the spread of these viruses. I don't, I don't, again, I don't have a problem with that. Some people might. We know that the protection from the diseases they cause can only be achieved by immunizing a very high percentage of the population. Now, anybody have a problem with immunization? Sure. No. Okay, what does it mean? What's immunity mean? It means you won't get it later. You have antibodies for it. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Let me show you the definition of immunity. Um, this is Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Immunity means freedom or exemption from obligation. Okay, now let's read that again. Let's go back to the letter. We know the protection from the disease that they cause can only be achieved by a very high percentage of the population being free or exempt from obligation. Anybody have a problem with that? That doesn't say vaccination. Vaccine's a very different thing. A vaccination is the injection of an animal virus into the body. So did the church ever encourage us to get the injection of an animal virus into the body? Not, not in the official letter. Sure. But when it was first presented, I listened to it myself, uh -huh. and they did say, we think everyone should be vaccinated. Uh, okay, you know. and where is this at? Do you remember where they said it? I was watching it on TV. Do you remember who said it? Uh, it was the president of the church. Okay, you sure? Well, that's who, who okay, seemed to so, be talking as he was getting his shot. Well, remember he said it, it's, um, it was a pen, uh, what did he call it? He said it, it is a literal godsend, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, what is a godsend in the Bible? What's the first godsend in the Bible? You may know it's the plagues of Egypt. So it is a literal godsend. And and they don't tell you to. They tell what did he tell us in 2018? One of the most important pieces of advice President Nelson gave, and he told you that in 2018. Hear him. You better get personal revelation or you will not survive what is coming. Two years later we get COVID. And they say, we believe people should be immunized, which means free or exempt from obligation. Now, you can take all that any way you want, right? We could parse this down. We could all have our own opinions. Um, but at the end of the day, President Nelson told you the key. Get personal revelation or you will not survive. And so one of the things I started trying to do is to explain to people, look, even if you disagree with my parsing of the record, okay, you still have the ability to do something else, right? What? How can you know when present circumstances and future circumstances should be faith-promoting <coughs> rather than faith 
destroying. <clears throat> How do you do that? What if you used the scriptures instead of Republicans and Democrats and politicians and lawyers and your church leaders? What if you took responsibility for yourself to study the scriptures, to understand the signs of the times, so that you didn't have to rely upon somebody else's mistakes or correctness for your own testimony? And what if you went to the scriptures and they testified of everything that was happening, such that you didn't need to lose your testimony? All you had to do was build your testimony and promote your faith through the study of the scriptures. Look at Lot, um, the story of Lot. For example, this is 2 Peter chapter 2. Now, this is a really, uh, what I love to find in the scriptures is I love to find the oddities. When you find somebody saying something that's kind of weird, and you stop and you, you just normally would tend to pass over that oddity because it seems so out of place or seems like an absurd statement, but God doesn't make pointless statements. <clears throat> Now that doesn't mean you can't have interpolations of men or mistranslations, but sometimes those oddities contain very important meanings. So let's take this for example. This is Peter in the second epistle of Peter where he is building up to something that he's going to cover in 2 Peter chapter 3. And in order to build the 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter uses the example of Lot. Now, if I came here tonight and I said something like, I thank, I thankest all of thee for coming here tonight. You would think that sounds weird. Why are you talking like that? Well, that's 16th century English and that's how we read 2 Peter chapter two. And because we read 2 Peter chapter 2 in a way that we would never speak, we tend to not understand 2 Peter chapter 2. So Sodom and Gomorrah were turned to ashes and condemned with an overthrow because they were living ungodly and they delivered Lot, or God delivered Lot, because Lot was vexed with filthy conversation of the wicked. Now, if you have an atheist friend and you say, you know what your problem is? You are vexed with the filthy conversation, or I am vexed by your filthy conversation, you <laughs> wicked person. Your friend would be like, yeah, you're an idiot. Right? Because nobody talks like that. So what is Peter saying here? Because this is a really important thing. What's happening in 2 Peter chapter 3 is super important. Well, here's the word vexed. Here's its Greek word. That's, that's where we got this. The King James Version comes from a Greek uh, translation. And I'm not going to try to pronounce that right. Kataponomenon. Being distressed, being worn down, or being oppressed. So Lot was oppressed and worn down and distressed. How many of you have ever felt oppressed since 2020? How many of you have felt worn down or distressed because of the events of the world today? Now, filthy conversation. That word is asalgeia or asalgeis. Uh, violent spite, which rejects restraint. Lawless in, uh, insolence and wanton caprice. Now, has anybody ever heard the term arbitrary and capricious? Where does that term come from? It's a legal term. And America was built on the principle of law that we would not do things that were arbitrary and capricious. Okay? For example, nobody's allowed to wear red and green shirts tonight. Why? Because I don't like them. I'm just kidding. I do like them. All right, I'm just trying to... But that wouldn't be fair if God worked that way and God tried to tell you, you know, I'll take the rest of you but not you too because I don't like the color of your shirt. That's arbitrary. That's my opinion. You're not supposed to govern a society based upon arbitrary beliefs and opinions. And so one thing that Peter is trying to tell you is that Lot was oppressed because of lawlessness, arbitrariness, and capriciousness. Then 
once we understand what, um, he'll also use the term licentious, and look at the original 16th century definition of licentious. Unrestrained by law, exceeding the limits of law or propriety. And we take the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and we turn it into a story of a gay community. That's not what it is. Now, you could argue that there, it has something to do with that, but that's not the point that Peter makes. Peter doesn't stop and talk about that at all. Peter instead talks about the wicked who are not in an acceptable order, are contrary to statute, and don't believe in being bound by law and custom. Now, do you believe that you live in a day where the government does not believe in being bound by the Constitution? Do you believe the Constitution has been jettisoned and it is now legal to oppress people based upon their religious beliefs? Okay, now if you believe that and you think that's an applicable interpretation here, you might be living in a time very similar to Lot and Peter might be talking to you. Now, Lot, who is dwelling amongst these arbitrary people, he's seeing and hearing and he's feeling oppressed in his soul day to day because of this unlawful state. So imagine living in a country that was founded on liberty, who within a couple hundred years begins to tell people, you can't go to church. Why not? Because there's a disease. Well, I feel like I need to go to church during the time of a disease because I think God could heal our country. Uh, sorry, you can't do that. It's illegal to <clears throat> worship in groups bigger than 50. That strikes me as a violation of my First Amendment right. Could I go protest that? No, not during COVID. Okay, could I go to the temple? No, those are closed too. Does that make sense to you? That seems like a violation of my First Amendment right, and it seems unlawful under the Constitution, but nobody really seemed to care in 2020 because there was this pandemic, and we all justified the closing of temples and churches based upon the existence of this pandemic. You hey, know, because of this behavior, God pronounces upon Sodom and Gomorrah. By the way, does anybody know where Sodom and Gomorrah were? Sodom and Gomorrah were two adjoining counties or cities that, la that laid on the Jordan Delta. So they laid down on the Jordan River and they were right by each other. Can you think of two big places right by each other on the Jordan River Delta? <laughs> Salt Lake County, Utah Salt Lake County, County, Utah County, Davis County, Salt Lake County. Um, it's interesting that we kind of match the physical descriptions of those two places. So the Greek word here for the overthrow is a catastrophe. Now this word gets really interesting. So when he says overthrow in Greek, the word is catastrophe. Now look at the definition of catastrophe in 16th century English. And what makes this comparison so uh, even more poignant is guess, guess when, this is a silly question, guess when Webster's 1828 dictionary was published? 1828. 1828. What else is going on in 1828? It was right before the establishment of the church. It was right before the establishment of the church, the translation of the Book of Mormon. Here you have a guy, Noah Webster, who claims to be inspired by God to write the 1828 dictionary. In the same time, Joseph is translating the plates, in the same time in which uh, we have embraced 16th century English as the means of communicating scriptural language. King James Version of the Bible is in 16th century English, the Book of Mormon is in 16th century English. The 1828 Dictionary, 16th century Biblical English. So you read the Book of Mormon using the 1828 Dictionary as a reference, and it's an amazing experience. So here we have this catastrophe, and in Webster's 1828 Dictionary, a catastrophe is a change or revolution which produces the final event of a dramatic piece. Anybody remember Elder Packer's talk? about the three-part drama of pre-mortal life, earth life, and post-mortal life. So the temple ceremony, you ever listen to Hugh Nibley, is from an ancient 
dramatic experience that is supposed to communicate uh, a series of events in the life of humanity as they progress towards God. So why would Peter be doing this? Why would Peter be covering Lot in 2 Peter chapter 2? Well, he tells you in, in 2 Peter 3. He says, knowing that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Scoffers are people who mock, deride, or re reproach, or show contempt. And then Peter says, where is the promise of his coming? Now, is Peter saying this after the Lord has died? Yeah. So the promise of what coming? Second. Second coming. And Peter says, now, you know, imagine this. This is an oddity. Right? This is weird. Imagine this, that Peter is trying to communicate to us information about the promise of the second coming. And he begins that, pro that, that information by saying, be not ignorant of this one thing. How important is that advice? Very. Here's the advice. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That's also really weird. You just told me when he's coming. And then said, but, even though I just told you, it will be as a thief in the night. How's that possible? How can you tell me when he's coming and then tell me, but it will be as a thief in the night? You just told me when he's coming. Right? Or you at least gave me the key to know when he's coming. So how can we know the key and yet it is as a thief in the night? Society is not prepared. It's okay. a thief to them. Who were the children of the night, according to the Lord? Oh, um, they were the Jews. Jews. Why? It's, it's not really a slight. What is the Jewish calendar based upon? The moon. The moon. When do you see the moon? At night. The children of the night. The people who are supposed to be tracking according to the moon. Who are the children of the day? Gentiles who are going to be given the fullness of the gospel, who are going to have temples everywhere. And so if you don't rise up to understand the fullness of the gospel, you might be a child of the night. If you have embraced the gospel and embraced the light of the Lord, you might be one of the children of the day. And his admonition is, for those who don't come out of the moon people who can't leave the moon sector who can't come into the sun he's probably going to appear to you as a thief in the night you won't recognize the signs so now here's why this statement is so interesting from a latter the, the latter-day saint theology is very unique because in the lds theology we contemplate that christ could have failed that is foreign to Christian thought. God doesn't fail. God is infallible. God can't fail. And yet, we have this notion that kind of comes out of the Book of Mormon that God could cease to be God. That's, you grew up with that if you're LDS. The Christian world did not. And so to pose, to, to, to present what I'm about to, to you would be very foreign to many other Christian faiths. Why would Christ say it is finished? What is finished? His work. His work on the earth. If he didn't finish the work pursuant to the commandments of the Father, what would happen? He would fail. Could he have the power to resurrect people? If he failed. No. Does he have a uh, does, is the Father bound to do what Christ asks if Christ doesn't finish the work? Okay, what day does this happen on? Friday. Okay, even if I don't, I agree, but even if I don't say that, it is the fourth day of the month 
in the first month of the year. That's from the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon says on the fourth day in the first month, a storm such as never has been known rose up on the face of the earth. Christ dies at that moment. So this is basically April 4th of 34 AD. Because in the Book of Mormon, it says in the 34th year, in the first month on the fourth day. So at what point in time does Christ get the power to revive <coughs> us as Hosea says he will do on the third day when he rises on April 4th 34 AD now after two days he will exercise that power he gained by fulfilling the will of the father and he will revive us and we will live in his sight when is the day in which people will live in the sight of the Lord? It's the millennial reign. So Peter tells you when Christ is coming. Right there. And we all think nobody can know. Why do we think that? Where do we get the notion that nobody can know? No man, may know. No man knows the day or the hour. That's scriptural. Now, I know that there's people out there who say, well, Joseph Smith made this statement. That's in the journal of a guy who wrote what he thought Joseph said. The scriptures say no man knows the day or the hour. So what does no man know the day or the hour of? His coming in glory. The great, the great and terrible day of the Lord. The coming of the Lord in all his glory. So what about the Mount of Olives? We definitely know that. He doesn't say it about the Mount of Olives. What about Adam on Diamon? Doesn't say it about Adam on Diamon. So what is Peter trying to say to us? Okay, so um, I wish I had put this one in there. Um, I, anybody watch The Chosen? I love I love that series not because I would say it's doctrine, but I really enjoy it. I love I love using my imagination and somebody else's imagination to see how human everybody who enters into this world is and I love the demeanor of Christ of the person who plays Christ in that and I really particularly enjoyed the episode of the woman at the well and I noticed something in the movie that I had never noticed before uh, that <clears throat> they're at Jacob's well I don't know how I never noticed that and they're at Jacob's well, outside of where? Samaria. Samaria. You know how Shemaria, uh, I just gave it away right there. You know how Samaria is written in Hebrew? Shem, Adia, Shemadia. Shem is the first word, which is, explore the history of Shem, it's fascinating. And look at how often Shem appears all over in scripture. Now, they're also in a land <coughs> called what? Anybody remember? Sakar. So the well is in Sakar, which is in Samaria. And Sakar means the drunkard. Who is the ruler of Samaria or the tribal ruler of Samaria? It's Ephraim. Jeroboam is the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel. And he is given rulership over the northern kingdoms and all of the tribes except Benjamin and Judah. So Ephraim is placed, and Jeroboam's an Ephraimite. So Ephraim is placed in charge of the northern kingdom of Israel and Samaria and Sakar. <clears throat> and so you have a place, Sakar, which is the drunkard in the land of Ephraim. Now does that ring a bell? <clears throat> Why would the Lord go to the Gentiles in the land of the drunkards of Ephraim and spend how long there? Why would he spend two days? Can you find any scriptural precedent for the Lord spending two days with the Gentiles? And if he did, when was the commission to go to the Gentiles given? <clears throat> After he sins. dies and sins in about 34 AD. Add two days to that in the Lord's time. 2034, the time of the Gentiles is over. The two days with the Gentiles is done. 
So it's not just Hosea. It's not just Peter. This parable is all over the place. Now, what's interesting also about that is you go over to the Old Testament into Isaiah chapter 28. And guess what you're going to get? A sermon on the drunkards, the Sicarians of Ephraim. Where are the modern day Ephraimites? Mostly in the U.S. Mostly in the U.S. <clears throat> and where are the greatest and most fat valleys of the world? Yes. I saw a geopolitical presentation when I was a state legislator on the Mississippi Valley and how the Mississippi Valley makes America what it is because of its ability to produce. The fattest valleys in the world are the Mississippi Valleys. So where are the Ephraimites today? Here. What state are the Ephraimites in today? They're drunkards. They don't know what they've been given and they sit on the fat valleys and they are overcome with wine. All of these scriptures, all of these verses hyperlink to each other and tell a much richer and fuller story than we often give them credit for. The Lord says he'll spend two days with them. And so does, and Peter tells us how long that is. Now, when, when you begin to realize that a lot of these things are only made possible by the theology introduced by Joseph Smith and carried forward by the LDS people, it, it becomes kind of a witness of something that embedded within the scriptures is a testament of the truthfulness of the restoration of the gospel that we never embraced as a people and we never carried forth with us as missionaries. And we weren't therefore able to speak to people in a way that they could not disbelieve our words. And our obligation now as a people is to take these things, to learn them in a time of prophetic promise because you remember what President Nelson said, you live in the day that Nephi saw. As a consequence of that statement, he cross-references in his talk what Nephi saw. And it says, a time in which nothing will be withheld. Any question you ask, as you approach the veil of the Lord in faithfulness, President Nelson promises you he will answer. So we have a duty now to take this as a people and to begin to teach it in a way that people cannot disbelieve our words. Now watch how this works out. In Daniel 8, we learn the concept that in the last end of the indignation, I will make, so let me, let me just paraphrase this right. <laughs> Daniel interprets the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, and God says through Daniel, I am going to make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. If you don't include that word, you miss out on all these rich cross-references to what is the indignation that are contained all over in the scriptures that deal directly with the second coming. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. So what did Daniel just tell us right there? No man knows the day or the hour, right? Not according to Daniel. At the time appointed, it shall be. Now, again, you, the, the Lord doesn't make mistakes. So there's got to be a time in which no man can know the day or the hour. And there also has to be an appointed time. So which is it? Right? What is what? Which is which? Here's one of our hints. Right in the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, the Lord says, let there be lights, and let them be for signs. Now, look closely. When he says, let there be lights, what is he talking about? Sun, moon, and stars. The lights that divide the day and the night. Sun and the moon. If you see a sun sign and a moon sign, those are important. If you see a sun sign, a moon sign, and a star sign all together, why did God place those in the heavens? 
to be for signs and for seasons. Okay, now look at this. At the time appointed, the end shall be. Keep that, keep that word, that phrase in your mind. For seasons. Here is the word seasons in Hebrew. It is moadim. Okay, keep that, let that ring around in your head. <clears throat> in Leviticus 23, the feasts of the Lord are the Lord's feasts in their moadim. Okay, now watch. Here is a feast. <clears throat> A moade. Here is an appointed time, a moadam. What's a season? Moadim. Feast, moade, appointed time, moadam, season, moadim. You think those words are connected? There they are, right there. Ula moadim, a moadam, and moade. And the place where they would go and do these things is the moed. So the Temple Mount and the altars were at the Moed. And the Moadim, or the Moadam, and the Moade, which were to correlate with the Moadim, would be done at the Moed. So what, what ends up happening is you, God gives Israel a commandment to take a lamb at a certain point in time and bring it to your house without blemish, prepare the lamb over a certain point in time, and on Passover to hold a feast in the appointed time, in the appointed season. And you know exactly when to do it. And the reason you know exactly when to do it is so that when he shows up in his final week and you're about to kill the lamb, you'll look at him and go, oh, this, him, this, him, he is why we did this. Right? So what do they do instead? Kill him. They don't even recognize that what they've been doing is standing right before him and they kill him. So, and one of the reasons, because they didn't know how to take these known times to prepare themselves for when he would actually appear. Have we done the same thing? What, what were we given instead of feasts? We're going to go over to Hosea again. Look at Hosea chapter 8. Now, do not take this wrong. <laughs> Please. So bear with me for a second. In Hosea chapter 8, the Lord says um, that the Gentiles, that Israel will be <coughs> swallowed up among the Gentiles. When did that come to fulfillment? That happened back in the Lord's day? Yeah? Is it true in our day? Okay, Ephraim has hired lovers. In other words, Ephraim, Ephraim is out of fidelity with the Lord. And one of the things that Ephraim starts to do, oh God, why do I always miss this word? I, some reason I, okay, right here. For Israel hath forgotten his maker and buildeth temples. That doesn't seem like a sign of people who have forgotten their maker. How can you say that Ephraim has forgotten their Lord and that they build temples? Okay, now go to Acts chapter 7. And while we're doing this, remember the problem that the Jews were having and why they didn't recognize the Savior when he came. <clears throat> they had taken the events that were meant to teach them about his coming and had turned them into something other than the lesson for which they were given. Go to Acts chapter 7. Now this is Stephen. This is a beautiful story. Stephen is awesome. Stephen gets up in his own trial <clears throat> where he is tried as a criminal in front of the people and condemned to death as a criminal. Let that sink in a little bit, right? One of the greatest men to ever live 
is a criminal tried in court by due process and then he's killed because he's convicted as a criminal. Stephen gets up in front of the people and the, particularly probably the Sanhedrin or a committee of the Sanhedrin and he begins to recite all the great fathers of Judaism and says you persecuted all of them to the Jews and then he says this I gotta go all the way down that's a beautiful one but there's another one I want I would highly recommend a good study of this chapter all right let me just cheat guess what he's gonna talk about there it is verse 48 how be it the most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands as saith the prophets heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool what house will ye build me saith the Lord or what is the place of my rest hath not my hand made all these things do you understand what he's saying he's not condemning the building of temples what's he condemning How they're using them. you think you're building them for me you're not building these for me I don't need temples built by the hands of men they're built for who they're built for you do you know why you go how many Latter-day Saints know why they go to the temple how many have come out and say I went to the temple why well to do work for the dead why do they need their work done well because if I don't do it they won't be sick well that you're amazing good for you and they're like yeah I did it you really think that's what the temples are built for or the temples meant to bring you to the veil and teach you of the second coming of the Savior how many of us are going to be sitting in the temple when he comes and not even know he's here because we're like the Jews getting ready to kill the lamb that represents him so isn't it interesting that these ancient prophets point to this thing of temple building and say it's a condemnation on you if what you don't use it for the reason God told you to do it just like it condemned the Jews when they were trying to carry out these feasts because they didn't know what it was pointing to so heaven forbid the Lord come and we're using the thing he gave us to ignore him now why would why would I say that well, I, I apply that personally. In 2020, I was not living like the Lord was coming. I was your average Mormon. The Lord was going to come in the future. I was good. I was an attorney, went to the temple, beautiful wife, beautiful kids, nice car, right? Pretty soon they're going to give me a calling, hire one, you know, that'll let everybody know that I did it all right. Isn't that how it works? And then I get to go to the celestial kingdom. But that's not how it works. That's not living like the Lord is coming. Living like the Lord is coming looks a little more painful than that. Stephen was living like the Lord was coming. The Lord showed you how to live. And what happened to him? Have you ever read the charges against the Lord? The, the ones not in the Bible? There's a thing called the Babylonian Talmud, and the Babylonian Talmud lists the charges against Christ. Let me read them to you. It read, 40 days prior to Passover Eve, the herald had cried, he is being led out for stoning because he has practiced sorcery and led Israel astray and entice them into apostasy whosoever has anything to say in his defense let him come and declare it as nothing was brought forward in his defense he was hanged on passover eve now how many times have you gone to church and heard a story about paying your tithing and in the end of the story the little old lady who paid her tithing had a miraculous blessing show up and she ate or got money yeah. in this other story that I just read you the faithful person is led to court <clears throat> tried in front of the people by due process 
convicted by due process, asked for people to speak to him, for him, nobody speaks, and so he's killed. That's a story of faith. I always wanted to hear the story of tithing where somebody paid it. They're tithing their last penny and they died. That's the story of Christ. Nobody even knows they died. The, the little widow pays her tithing, calls out for help, the people mock her, and she dies. That's the story of Christ. How many of us are willing to take everything we have in the name and witness of the Lord, give it all up, and live like he is coming? Who does that anymore? I don't know anybody. I don't. I, maybe that's shame on me, right? For, for not mingling with good people. Um, I kind of think that in the last days, in fact, let's just review. Abraham, law-abiding citizen or criminal? Law-abiding. He's a criminal. criminal. He fled his country. He refused to participate and give himself over as a sacrifice. How about... Um, Let's, let's see. Um, I go to Jacob, but that's a little more difficult. Moses. Ah, criminal. Criminal. Yeah. Right? Uh, Jesus. Criminal. Convicted criminal. Yeah. Okay. Um, Stephen. Criminal. Joseph Smith. Criminal. Brigham Young. Criminal. Are you seeing a pattern? If you're not a criminal by the time you die, you probably won't go to the <coughs> celestial kingdom. <laughs> now think about that in the last days good will be called evil and evil good and if you're called good you're probably not you're probably doing something wrong now that's my opinion don't believe me go study it for yourself okay so let's go back to this concept of appointed times Job 38.2 Canst thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? Or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? The Maseroth is the Jewish uh, zodiac before we turn the zodiac into witchcraft. How many pieces are there on the zodiac? Twelve. How many are there in the Maseroth? It's twelve. How many tribes of Israel? If you want to study true astronomy or true, the true Maseroth, go read the patriarchal <coughs> blessings of the 12 tribes and apply them to their appropriate constellation to understand why the constellation is there in the night sky to bear witness of God and of his divine calendar and his appointed times. Um, <clears throat> Now, what makes this so important, these concepts, is you go to Luke. And in Luke, the apostles, again, here's an oddity, a really strange thing. If the Lord, let's pretend that all of us lived in about 31 AD, and we were in this room and the Lord walked in, 31 AD, and he sat down up here and began to talk with us. Would you take that moment in 31 AD to ask him when he's coming again? Or would you be impressed by the fact that he's here? Impressed by the fact that he's here. Look at what his apostles do. <clears throat> Will you tell us when you're coming again? I mean, think about how dumb of a question that is. Dude, you're going to be dead when that happens. Take advantage of the fact that he's sitting right in front of you right now and ask him a relevant question. <laughs> but obviously I'm wrong. They're not dumb. And that's a really important question and because they are his disciples, they know that. So why would they ask that question? Once again, thinking of us and our time, they write that in the times of the Gentiles, when the Gentiles time is fulfilled, uh, and the Lord will spend two days so we kind of get a general idea of how long that is. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And, right, it's not enough just to have the signs in the sun, moon, and stars. You've got to have all three. But it has to happen in a time of distress. distress. 
2004, three years after the fall of the Twin Towers, Elder Oaks gets up in general conference and says what? We live in the time prophesied where all things shall be in commotion. That is repeated over and over in general conference after 2004. So here we are in 2023 with the fulfillment of that prophecy stated over the pulpit by a living prophet and in the time of the signs of the sun, moon, and stars. Okay, this is August 21st, 2017. How many of you went and watched the solar eclipse? This is the shadow that it cast. So when you think of how it, when it's blocked, it casts kind of this angular shadow across the United States. Now, what's right in here? Independence, Adamondiaman, Jackson County, Davis County, all the important sacred land sites of the LDS Church sit in that shadow. This is a this is the solar eclipse coming in April of 2024. It will cross the opposite way. They will cross together in Missouri. And this one will cross, guess what? Kirk, Kirtland, Nauvoo, Palmyra, the Sacred Grove, all of the sacred spots of the church. They will form over time in X. In Hebrew is a Tav, and the Tav means the end. August 21st, 2017 is the date of the solar eclipse. It's the day of Rosh Chodesh Elul, which is a, a starting of a 10 day period of time of repentance to prepare Israel for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah will, uh, will begin and be followed by Yom Kippur and Sukkot uh, on September 21st to October 6th, 2017. So not only will we get a solar eclipse, on a Jewish holiday in 2017, we will also get uh, a sign in the stars with the sun and the moon and the stars on Rosh Hashanah in 2017. This is the sign. It is a woman, Virgo, with nine, or sorry, 12 stars at her head, the sun at her shoulder, the moon at her feet, and Jupiter, having come out of her belly, and Jupiter is Zedek in Hebrew, as in Melchizedek. And that picture right there is contained in a scripture. What is it? It's Revelation chapter 12. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon at her feet and a crown of 12 stars at her head, including Leo, the lion or Which king of cool. Judah. Now, what's interesting about this is the Catholic Church heard the Christian fervor that came about because of this sign in 2017. And so the Catholic Church's Vatican astronomer did an entire write-up on this event and said, it's not what you think it is. The Lord's not coming, okay? Interesting news from the Catholic Church. Um, and I appreciate their opinion, but here's the wonder of witnesses. This guy writes, yes, multiple planets being at Virgo's head while Jupiter is in Virgo's center and the moon is at Virgo's feet is somewhat unusual, but it's not that unusual. By the way, it also happened in September of 1827 <laughs> to prove that it's not unusual. Now, for those of you laughing, you know that September of 1827 was Rosh Hashanah and the day in which Joseph Smith got the golden plates from the angel Veroni. Now what's interesting about that date, you know Joseph, here's, if you know the answer to this, don't shout it out too quick. Because more than likely a lot of you are going are to get this wrong just like I did. What is the day in which the kingdom of God was founded on the earth? 
Okay, I hear somebody saying it right. I used to think, well, God, that's easy, April 6, 1830. <clears throat> Until you read the records of Joseph Smith and his personal secretary, as contained in the Joseph Smith papers, which the church has released over the last decade, in which it reads, the kingdom of God was founded on March 11th, 1844. What's that? It's the Council of 50. That's the group of people who under DNC 136 brought the church out to Utah and then became the territorial government of the state of Deseret. Now, here's where it gets awesome. If you see a sign in the heavens of the woman, the church, about to bear a child, the kingdom of God, and you see one sign in 1827, and then the woman, the church, actually does give birth to the kingdom of God in 1844. All you have to do is some simple math. 1844 minus 1827, 1827 is? 16. Close? 17. 17 years. That's why I never do math in public. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Because <laughs> um, I know the answer and I'll still get it wrong. <laughs> That's how bad I'm at math. Okay, now, now think about that. In Luke, Peter says, remember this one thing what one day one day to the lord is as a thousand years hosea says he will revive us after two days the story of sikar and the woman at the well he will spend two, two days. days he says it is finished in 34 a.d at 2000 of that 2034 okay when did you see the sign of the woman in the heavens 1827 17 years later the kingdom of god is born 2017 the sign of the woman comes back at 17. 2034 now that could be a coincidence that's just a coincidence because you know as Brigham and i like to say joseph smith's a good guesser not a prophet but once you see so many coincidences you kind of can't help but believe that joseph smith was in fact a prophet of god now here we are you know september 23rd 1827 and in 1827 sorry in isaiah 29 we read that ariel is to be distressed the city of david the city of david is jerusalem and that ariel will be brought down and that happens in about 70 A.D. Jerusalem is completely brought down by a siege, just as Isaiah pro prophesied, and raised completely to the ground. And then Isaiah says, Thou shalt be brought down, and shalt speak out of the ground. And thy speech shall be low out of the dust. And thy voice shall be as of one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust the book of mormon is obviously true for anyone who has eyes to see and ears to hear and we have had all of this prophecy from the very beginning coupled with the book of mormon the doctrine and covenants of the pearl of great price and living prophets of god and we have as a people i'm not talking about the brethren we as a people have failed to take this witness to the world such that they could not disbelieve our words. And this, this is just the beginning. It just gets better and better and better and more uh, proving of itself as we go on. Isaiah then says, Behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. There is only one single people upon the face of the earth who carry that concept forward to this day. You could try to argue somebody else does. There ain't nobody in the world who invokes that term and seeks to do that work like the LDS people. Okay, now in Revelation 12, we go to this sign. And I'm, I want to decide if we want to... Okay, let's, let's spend a little bit of time there. Let's go to this sign in Revelation chapter 12. And let's look at it a little bit more closely. Because, yeah, let's do this first. Okay, there appeared a great wonder in heaven. 
Joseph Smith will write a translation of this in which he'll say, instead, there appeared a great sign in heaven. Remember what the purpose of the stars and the sun and the moon are for, relative to us, to be signs and for seasons. There appeared a great sign in heaven in the likeness of things on the earth. So when we see this sign, that sign is supposed to bear witness of things that happen on the earth. There appeared a, a, a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. What is the woman? The church. The church. The church. When did the woman appear? April 6th, 1830. And that woman wasn't just given the Aaronic or Levitical powers. She was given the powers of the Melchizedek, the sun, and the Aaronic or Levitical, the moon. And she was given keys placed into the quorum of the 12 apostles as specified where? In the Doctrine and Covenants. And she became pregnant with a child. The church did. And the church travailed for a long period of time, about 17 years from 1827 to about 1844, until the church finally gave birth to the child or the kingdom of God on earth, whose king was who? You're going to get it wrong, so don't say it. Who was it? Oh, the king was. Who was the king? Brigham. Brigham. No. See, so good. You just caught yourself almost. Joseph. Joseph. Joseph is sustained by the Council of Fifty in its first meeting as king over the whole earth, holding the rod, the right to rule on behalf of who? His king, Christ. Now, here's where the story gets a little bit odd. Why would this narrator... And you'll see why this is odd. Maybe we should come back to it to show the oddity of this verse. There appeared another wonder in heaven, a great red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. Now that part's the odd part. The next part makes sense. His tail drew the third part of the stars. How many stars are there? Twelve. It's twelve. Does anybody prove there's more than twelve stars in this chapter? There's only 12. So you know exactly how many one third part of 12 is. It is four. four. So where do you get the notion that a third of the host of heaven fell? Where does that come from? Traditions of the fathers. Okay, yeah. Now watch this. The third part of the stars, now in Hebrew, the stars of heaven are the noble and great ones. In LDS tradition, what we've done is we've mixed two theologies. You go to DNC 29, 36 through 38. It came to pass that Adam being tempted of the devil, for behold, the devil was before Adam, for he rebelled against me, saying, give me thine honor, which is the, uh, my power. And also, here's the tricky part. A third part of the hosts of heaven turned he away from me because of their agency. We take those two things and we mix them together, and we get both of them wrong. And here's how we get both of them wrong. In verse 37, they, because God is merciful. <coughs> One of the greatest mistakes I ever made in my life was believing that my sins made me unworthy to testify of Christ. And so I lived my whole life thinking I always needed to become more and more perfect until someday I was good enough to go out and bear testimony of Christ. You will never be good enough. You will never be complete. You will never stop making mistakes in this world. And if you wait for that day, you will never fulfill your baptismal covenant to bear witness at all times and in all places of the Lord. And then you will fail. And that would be sad. So don't do that. Tomorrow, start bearing witness of Christ everywhere you go and everything you do. And your life will get exponentially better. Now, look at what happens to these people. This is how merciful God is. They were thrust down, and thus came the devil and his angels, and behold, there is a place prepared for them, which is hell. Now, that should blow your mind right now. 
Because where do the sons of perdition go? Outer darkness. Where do the third part of the hosts of heaven who supposedly fell before they ever came here go and never get a mortal body? Hell. Hell. What happens in hell? Where do we find the doctrine of hell? You know this. It's DNC 76, where they wait to be resurrected, according to DNC 76. So where are these people who fell that don't get to get resurrected? The third that we talk about. They don't exist. There is nowhere in Scripture. In fact, the doctrine is completely contrary to the notion that a third of the host of heaven fell and will not be resurrected. I'll show you DNC 76, okay? <clears throat> Remember, where, where are those people going? They're going to hell. There is a place prepared, prepared for them, which is hell. These are they who are thrust down to hell. These are they who shall not be redeemed from the devil until the last resurrection. What a merciful plan the Lord has made. That we no longer have to worry about a God who would take a third of his children before they ever come here and cast them to outer darkness. That's always never made sense to me. And here in LDS theology, we learn that you probably can't even find anyone for sure that the Lord will ever give up on. All right, let's go back. Um, Revelation chapter 12. Some interesting theology that John teaches in Revelation 12 is there. Now, this tale of this dragon will draw the third part of the stars, four of the twelve. Of the original 12 apostles that Joseph Smith called, eight of them left the church, and four returned. So how many were drawn away and never came back? Four. <laughs> Joseph Smith. He manipulated all eight of them to leave, and then convinced four of them to come back so that Joseph could prove he was a prophet, right? <laughs> That's the kind of stuff you have to start to believe in. One of the great mistakes that all the apostates have made that run around trying to convince people that the church is not true and that you know, Brigham Young is a fallen prophet have never read the scriptures. So they become these scholars of history and they've read all these documents and they'll sit up in front of you and they'll say, boy, I, I read this and I read this. And that means Brigham Young's a fallen prophet. Really? Well, I read the scriptures. I'm not a scholar like the rest of you. And the scriptures seem to indicate that Brigham Young's not a fallen prophet. And those people who will say those things don't know the scriptures because that's not where their testimony is. Their testimony is in something else. So watch what happens. Once the four apostles are going to fall away and never come back, John is going to let us know that the woman will flee into the wilderness. So once Joseph Smith is killed on June 27th of 1844, and Joseph Smith is caught up unto God, then the church will do what? Flee into the wilderness. Flee in 1846 to 1847, and Brigham Young will come down into the valley and say what? This is the place. Okay, and John says the woman will flee to the place. place. Now Brigham Young just did that. He did it on purpose to fulfill that prophecy. <laughs> right? that's, that's what he did, right? And the woman is going to be nourished there. Now remember, where are we at? Where's the setting right now? Is this on earth or in heaven? Earth. earth. No. This is things in heaven, in likeness of things on earth. And watch how John's going to fix that problem for us. In heaven, the woman is fed 1,203 score days. And then John's going to say, oh, and by the way, we had our heavenly Adam on Diamon. So he'll just skip the entire history of the church from 1847 to Adam on Diamon. And you're like, wait a sec, finish that. I, I want to hear the rest of that. Now, you know why this is the heavenly Adam on Diamon? Who is the Ancient of Days? Who is Adam in heaven? Okay, here's Michael showing up to fight the battle and to defeat the devil at the heavenly 
Adam on Diamond. This isn't the second coming. This isn't in similitude of the second coming. If it was in similitude of the second coming, then the Lord would show up and defeat. So who shows up at Adam on Diamond? I know the Lord will, but what does Daniel say? The Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days, which causes the, the throwing down of all nations. So, so John is going to just skip all that time, and we lose this really rich history of the church in prophecy until John says, hold on, I'm going to show you. After the dragon was cast to the earth, he did it again. He persecuted the woman again. And the woman, the church, was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into her place. Now, who's the eagle? The Council of Fifty in about 1844 and to 1847 is already under the direction of Joseph Smith preparing a letter for Congress asking Congress to give the church permission to go to the Rocky Mountains and colonize the Rocky Mountain West. And after Joseph dies, Congress will honor that request and will give the church basically a charter to form the territory of the state of Deseret. And the Council of Fifty will become the territorial government of the state of Deseret. So it is the eagle that permits the woman to fly into the wilderness where she doesn't have 1,260 days. She has how long? Time, times, and half a time. Now, when the saints come into the valley, they will honor the law of the Lord. And that's the wrong presentation. Okay, let me find it. Give me a sec. They'll honor the request of the Lord to do what? Declare a Sabbath upon the land as the Lord commands in the book of Leviticus, I think. It might be Deuteronomy. I'll show you. I may pull up the wrong slideshow again. <laughs> if so, give me just... Yeah, I'm just going to tell you. It's easier just to tell you because then I want to show you something else. So in Leviticus, the Lord says, when you go into the land that I have given you, you should declare a Sabbath cycle. And what's the Sabbath cycle? It's a seven-year cycle. Seven of those is 49 years. And the Lord says, once you make it through that, then you need to declare a Jubilee. Jubilee. In 1897, 50 years after coming into the valley, the saints uh, will hold a Jubilee. And Elder Anthon Lund, who is a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, will get up at General Conference, and he'll say, this is our Jubilee year. So we know the saints are living this Jubilee cycle. Sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once and failing at both. So let me find the one, and then I'll do justice to the concept. Okay, so Anthony Lund gets up and he says, hey, this is our Jubilee 50 years later. So what if a time is a Jubilee? Now take one Jubilee plus two Jubilees plus a half a Jubilee. And what do you get? 175. They go into the valley in 1847 and they go through a Jubilee, two Jubilees, and a half a Jubilee. And what does John the Revelator say? Once the woman is nourished for a times, times, and half a time, protected from the face of the serpent. The serpent will cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, and the earth will help her for 175 years. And the earth will swallow up that flood so that the flood cannot overcome the woman as she goes into her place. But once that period ends, and the protection is taken away, you would expect to see an overflowing. And where can you read about an overflowing? The overflowing scourge from the Doctrine and Covenants prophesied to come upon the saints in the very last days prior to the Lord comes again. 
Now, if you take 1847 plus 175, what do you get? 2022. 2022, which is the end of the third seven-year cycle predicted by President Hinckley in 2001 in his talk, Living in the Fullness of Times, I think it's called. Remember how he says, I cannot help but think of the lesson of Pharaoh relative to the fat kind, the lean kind, the good stocks, and the withered stocks. So 2001, President Hinckley says that, add seven to 2001. Anything happen in 08? Yeah. Add seven to 08. <clears throat> the introduction of gay marriage is the law of the land by the Supreme Court in June of 2015 and a micro recession in 2015. Add seven to that. 2022. 2022, the end of the nourishment period. Does the church start to suffer unprecedented problems starting in 2022? I'd say go back to 2020 and the church starts to suffer unprecedented problems, being forced to close down its churches and temples by law because of a pandemic. And then most recently, starting in 2022 up in Canada, what happens? Canada begins to investigate the tithing expenditures of the LDS church. 2023, the SEC levies a fine against the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for what? for supposedly hiding money from the government. Heaven forbid you hide money from secret combinations because then they can't steal it from you as easily as they would like to. <laughs> and we have people in the church being critical of the church for hiding their money from the Gaddy Ant and robbers. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. When I saw that, I was like, hallelujah, finally. Finally, we're becoming the criminals we were always meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> so we know that's going to happen. We know the time in which it's going to happen. And we know that the dragon is again going to make war with the remnant of her seed. And why would John say this? Because John is trying to prepare us for the moment in which the beast will rise up out of the sea, having seven hordes, seven heads, ten horns, ten crowns in the name of blasphemy. And what's going to happen as a result of him rising up now is he's going to be given power to make war with the saints and to overcome, overcome them. them. So why would your testimony ever be affected when the church begins to recede in power and be overcome by the dragon? Wow. It shouldn't be. It has to happen, because if it didn't happen, we would all use the church as our crutch and never rise up to be the people God wanted us to be. The church was never meant to protect us. How many of you men, if you're at home, who's married? Men, raise your hand if you're married. Okay, you love your wife? Yep. You're laying in bed next to your wife and a thief comes into your house in the middle of the night, you hear the bump in the night, and you look over at your wife, you look over at your dresser, you grab the gun out of the dresser, and you hand it to your wife and say, go get him, honey. <laughs> That's what we've become. 2020, the church gets attacked under a pandemic, and all the people in the church are like, well, what's the church doing about it? Why is that your question? That's like handing the gun to your wife. The church is the woman. We're the men. We were supposed to protect the church. We were supposed to create a government in which the church was free. We were supposed to create a state where the federal government could never take money from our church. Because what business is it of the SEC to tell our church how to spend our money? That is so wrong in so many ways. And if you can't comprehend that, I mean, I don't know. Well, think they, about they, that one. You don't That's even all have that criminal intent. In the case of the SEC filings, they file individual filings for each corporation, but fail to file an aggregate. So, so let me tell you what's frightening about this. Do you know why the church could be fined? You know what law it is? I looked it up. It's the social, it's sorry, the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. When you violate the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, you can be subjected to a fine and guess what else? A reference to the Department of Justice for the prosecution of a crime. You know why the church wasn't prosecuted for a crime? 
because it's a crime under the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. They weren't charged with the crime because they settled it with the SEC by paying $5 million in blood money to Gadianton robbers so that the Gadianton robbers wouldn't come after them and prosecute them for doing something that wasn't immoral in the first place. But the law has made a moral act immoral and says if we want to, we can refer this to the Justice Department to come and prosecute who? Uh, president. Uh, That's right, the president of the church. We have created a system of government that now subjects our prophet and president to criminal prosecution because we have given our control of our government to the Gadianton robbers. You think the Lord's going to let that stand? What does the Lord do to a people who give sole management of the government to Gadianton robbers? He destroys them. Okay, so you know what's coming for Utah. You know what's coming for America. And if you don't believe that, then you must think God is a liar because he's wiped out Israel for less in the past. Okay, so we know this is coming. Now, what John will also do, now, now think about this for a second. Think about how amazing it is that the history of the church is prophesied by date exactly in one chapter of the New Testament. That's amazing. That would take Joseph Smith and Brigham Young coordinating at every point to create all of these events, including getting Joseph killed and Brigham Young fleeing into the wilderness. And Brigham Young's got his note as he rolls down in the valley. He's like, what am I supposed to say? Oh yeah, this is the place because they're trying to match this. Now, John will give you a hint about where to go next. John says, the eagle helped the woman. So where could you find a parable of an eagle that picks up the story? Close. It comes before Ezra. Okay, go to Ezekiel chapter 17. <clears throat> Okay, look at the look at the second verse. Put forth a riddle, a parable for who? The house of Israel. And say, Thus saith the Lord, a great eagle with great wings, long wing full of feathers, which had diverse colors. Why would that be important? Where do we get the concept of diverse colors? The coat of many colors. Joseph. So whoever this eagle <laughs> is. They have the blessing of Joseph upon them. Could that be America under the Constitution? Anything more or less than this, the Lord says, in the Doctrine and Covenants cometh of evil. Therefore, he tells us to befriend the Constitution because he raised up the men who created it for that very purpose. This eagle will still be on the Lord's side at this time. And this eagle is going to take the highest branch of the cedar. Now you know who that is because you've read the Book of Mormon. <clears throat> and in the Book of Mormon, 2 Nephi 3, 5, it says, Joseph truly saw our day, and he obtained a promise of the Lord that out of the fruit of his loins, the Lord God would raise up a righteous branch unto the house of Israel, not the Messiah, but a branch which was to be broken off. Just, now, have you ever <laughs> comprehended that Ezekiel 17, verse 3, connects with 2 Nephi 3, 5. It took me till I was 50 years old to see that. Joseph Smith made it up in 90 days. <laughs> right? You'd have to believe that, to believe that Joseph Smith could not only write the Book of Mormon, but create massive numbers of correct hyperlinks back to the Old Testament that are correct. So here's Joseph, the highest branch of the cedar. And, and Joseph and is- And cedar is that strong wood too. It's, it represents 
that's something. Elijah camped under the juniper <clears throat> cedar. Same. Yep. Okay, so Joseph is cropped off, and Joseph and his followers are carried into a land of traffic. Now that word, Canaan, traffic, where's the original land of Canaan? You got Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan. Adam is driven out of the garden. Out to where? Probably Adam on the Almond where ends his life. It says Enos is driven out of the land of Shilom into the land which he names after his son and calls it Canaan. The real land of Canaan is pre-flood somewhere in the United States of America. So Joseph is going to be driven into the land of Canaan and Joseph is going to be set in a city of Okay, what's in Hebrew, there's a word um, that means commerce, merchants, and trade. Is that Nauvoo? What is no. the name of Nauvoo before it's Nauvoo? Oh, what the city of commerce. It's the city of merchants, it's That's commerce. Right. So Ezekiel prophesies where Joseph Smith will be in order. And then it will say that the seed of the land Right, this is the gathering of Israel into Nauvoo, will then be taken and placed by great waters. Do the saints get planted in a city <coughs> called the city of merchants, and then are they taken to a place by great waters? Show me one other church that can do that. And fulfill all the elements of Revelation chapter 12. See, because it gets more and more difficult as you progress down the chain of prophecy. Now, you cannot believe that my interpretation is correct, but I guarantee you, you're not going to find another church that can do this. So you don't have to believe me, right? But you can't deny what it says. All you can argue with is the fact that I have a really good skill at placing things in order convenient to my belief. Okay? Now, that could be true. So you've got to determine if you think it's correct. Now, what does the Lord call that people once they are set by the great waters? The willow tree. The saints become the willow tree. And not just the willow tree, they become the vine. So now, when you read Ezekiel and you find reference to the vine, you can know who Ezekiel is talking about. When Ezekiel talks about the great waters, you can know where Ezekiel is talking about. Now, once the saints are planted by the great waters and they become the vine, by the way, anybody know what the Vikings called America? <coughs> Vinland. Why would the Vikings call America Vinland? You know what it means? The Vineland or the vineyard. So the Vikings remnants of the lost tribes of Israel called America the vineyard, just like Jacob does in chapter 5 and the Lord does in DNC 101. Okay, so the vine will turn its branches towards the Lord, and the roots thereof were under him, so it became a vine and brought forth branches, and, and there arises another great eagle. This is Ezra's eagle. This is the wickedness that comes upon America once they enslave an entire race of people and kill God's prophet and drive the church out from their midst. You can't keep the Lord's favor upon you if you enslave people, kill people, and persecute religion. So look at what the saints are going to do with the new eagle. The vine did bend her roots towards this new eagle. That's not good. And they shoot forth her branches toward him that he might water it by the furrows of her plantation. So where is the Lord made the plantation of the saints? By the great waters. And he was watering them. But then the saints began to turn their vine towards this other eagle and wanted this new eagle to become the waterer of the vineyard. You think the Lord's happy about that? <clears throat> it was planted in good soil by great waters. 
that it might bring forth branches, that it might bear fruit, that it might be a goodly vine. Say thou, thus saith the Lord God, shall it prosper? You know the answer to that question. The answer is no. But the Lord pronounces the time upon which the curse will come. He says, Shall he not pull up the roots, therefore, and cut off the fruit thereof, that it wither? It shall wither in the leaves of her spring. Now think about that. When did the saints start to confront trouble in Utah? March. Was it in their summer? Was it in their fall? Or was it early in their planting almost right away in Utah? The Antichrist Salt Lake Tribune rises up. You get the Congress pressing against the saints. Uh, the Edmunds Tucker Act turns all of the leaders of the church into criminals by, the eight, uh, by 1901. Right, so almost immediately, 1858, well, we'll come back to that in a sec. I won't ruin that yet. <clears throat> okay, so shall it prosper? Shall he not pull up the roots, uh, cut off the fruit that it wither, even without great power or many people to pluck it up by the roots? Yea, behold, being planted, shall it prosper now look at this this is amazing how do you know when the saints will suffer the curse of turning their vine towards this other eagle when the east wind toucheth it where do you think the first reference to the east wind is in scripture close it's better to see it than for me to say it and this is probably worth seeing. All you got to do is go into your scriptures. Jeremiah 18. East wind. Okay, we might come there. Hold on a sec. I could be wrong. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not. Look at that. Genesis 41. What parable are we in? 41. What parable are we in? The one President Hinckley stated in 2001. The parable of the fat and the lean kind, the good and withered stocks. Right after the fall of the Twin Towers, the east wind blasts the nation or the people and they begin, they begin to wither and to suffer. So we look at that in Ezekiel and we know when it's going to happen when the east wind hits. And then he says, say to the rebellious house, now find me in this world one other people who claim to be the house of the Lord quite like the Mormons do Jewish people okay so being Latter-day Saints thank goodness the Lord's not talking to us we're only his house when we want to be he must be talking about the Jews right we know that's not true that's not fair so here's when it's all going to fall apart Say to the rebellious house, know ye not what these things mean. Tell them, behold, the king of Babylon is come to Jerusalem and taken the king thereof and the princes thereof and led them with him to Babylon. In 1847, the saints go to the place of the great waters. They become the vine. They turn their roots towards the other eagle. The Lord says, here is the sign. Who's the king of Babylon? You got another history of Utah. 1858, Alfred Cummings is appointed when the president of the United States deposes Brigham Young as the governor of the territory of Deseret. And from this point on, the king of Babylon, the president of the United States, will be in charge of appointing all the governors of Utah starting in 1858. So tell the people of Utah that the President of the United States has come to Salt Lake City and has taken the governor to himself and the legislature, and he has led them to Washington, D.C. And what happens by 1896? We become a state. We become a state. Not on equal footing. Why? Under the Utah Constitution, we were not permitted to enter constitutionally into the union of the United States on equal footing. Oh, shoot. Um, look behind. I can't. Oh, all right. Um, 
I'm gonna have to plug this into so we're at 20, 21%. So, okay, I'm just gonna tell you. Go look this up later and confirm what I say. Article three of the Utah Constitution has four provisions. One is we will always have freedom of religion. Do you believe that? <laughs> There's an except. In Article Three, Section One of the Utah Constitution, we are told that we will always be free except. Whenever you see something that says you are always free except, what does it mean? You really are free. not free. So Article One guarantees that we will never be religiously free in Utah. That's what it guarantees. Two, I think, is um, money. We get money. Yeah, the government agrees to pay all of our debts as a state. So we were bought for money, a mess of pottage. Three, we agree to give up all the land in our state to the federal government. Four, we agree to put all of our children in public schools where religion will never be taught. Now, does that sound like the birthright of Israel? Land, money price, giving up your children, and giving away your priesthood rights. That's the birthright. We literally sold the birthright as a people to become a part of the United States. And so when the Lord says, befriend the Constitution, he knows what he's talking about. He knows we're going to fail. He's prophesying that we won't be able to handle his government, the kingdom of God. And so he will mercifully let us enter into a government that we prefer that he set up for that very purpose, right? The Lord's got all sorts of purposes. And so he'll do it this way. And then look what Ezekiel says. He's not going to just capture your governorship under Brigham Young. He's going to take all the governors from there on, the seat of the governors. He will make a covenant with them. Did that happen? 1896, 1858 for that matter. Who do people in Utah begin to swear an oath to instead of God? The United States. A constitutional oath of office. And he says, he'll even take the mighty of the land. And all of the people of Utah will leave the covenant of the kingdom of God and will <laughs> enter into the constitutional oath of office for governance from that time on. Now, you might say, well, that's okay because the constitutional oath of office is good. I, I agree. Watch how the Lord does this. How many of you have ever read the proclamation on polygamy? It's a Wilford Woodruff, right? And we all say, well, um, what well, had to happen? Okay, maybe. But do you know the justification that Wilford Woodruff gives for entering into the agreement with the United States to prevent the church from having everything taken from them? He says, we got to do this so that um, the kingdom will be debased some, but at least we'll survive. You read the whole sermon that follows the proclamation, and it basically <coughs> says, we're going to be debased. But if we don't, they will take everything from us. And so Wilfred Woodruff doesn't say we're going to do this. You know what he says? Go out and ask the Lord yourself. And if you do, he'll tell you. And so the saints, the Latter-day Saints, choose to let go of certain portions of the restored gospel. So that the kingdom will be debased, it won't lift itself up, but that by keeping of his covenant, we will at least stand. Now, whose covenant? The oath of the king of Babylon. Now watch how this can only apply to Utah. You can't put this on any other state. But he, who's he? This is where it gets a little confusing. He is the king of the vine, or the people in the land. He rebels against God by sending ambassadors to Egypt. Where is modern Egypt? Washington, Washington D.C. Washington, it's, it's America. That they might give him horses and much people. Shall he prosper? Shall he escape? that doeth such a thing. 
or shall he break the covenant and be delivered? This is a violation of the, the constitutional oath of office because we are subjected to Babylon. And who are we making deals with? The sacred combination. Egypt. See, the Lord placed the people under covenant to Babylon and said, you're going to be ruled by them. And now you've got the governor of the land going behind the back of the Babylonians and entering into secret combinations with Egypt while Babylon is their vassal. Or sorry, their, their master. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. As I live, saith the Lord, surely in the place where the king dwelleth that made him king. Where's the place where the Babylonian king dwells? Today it's Washington, D.C. Where, where's the king who gets subjected to him? Utah, Jerusalem. He says, Whose oath he despised, whose covenant he break, even with him in the midst of Babylon shall he die. He pronounces the end of Utah government right there. You went and you turned against the place I put you, and you're not going to escape. You're going to die where you made this little where you made the betrayal. Pharaoh, he says, won't be able to save you, not even with his mighty armies. Now here's where, here's the part I've been hinting at that I haven't delivered on yet. Seeing he, okay, you gotta liken this unto yourself, the governor of Utah despised the oath, his constitutional oath of office by breaking that oath. When he had given his hand to the king of Babylon, he hath done all these things, he shall not escape. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, as I live, surely mine oath that he hath despised. How can you break an oath to the Lord and an oath to Babylon? Because the Lord gave us the kingdom of God, and we let it go. And now the keys of the kingdom of God sit where? Quorum of the twelve. That's where Joseph put him. You read the Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph says, that's where I'm putting the keys. So those keys go dormant. And what happens to the church? They're placed under subjection, not in the state of Deseret anymore, but to Babylon. And he says, you broke that oath, and you despised my oath. What other state can answer those two things? What other state in the Union has been under the oath of God as a government and under the oath of Babylon as a government. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, as I live, surely my oath that he hath despised. Um, and my covenant that he hath broken, even it will I recompense upon his own head. Now, here's where this gets just, in my opinion, mind blowing. Guess who the king was? Who did this? Let me pull up a chart so you can see it. Okay, let's see. I've got like 50 of these, so bear with me. So I can find it. And watch me not be able to do it. Let's try this again. Shoot. Um, I swear I have this in here. Okay. Um, so what's really interesting about this event in Ezekiel 17 when we talk about the king of Jerusalem going over to Egypt and taking money, Utah as a state, okay? We're talking statehood, not territorial government. Rehoboam is the first king of the southern kingdom of Judah. Heber Wells is the first governor of the state of Utah. The ancient southern kingdom of Judah had 20 kings. Utah has had 18 governors. Now, this, I usually don't have this. If I write this word and ask you to pronounce that word, 
How would you say that? Judah. Okay. How would the ancient Judeans have said it? Judah. Oh my gosh. Judah. Okay. Judah. Yehuda. Because the J or the Y is a yeah. Yeah. Yehuda. Now, say that or spell that the way you say it. Now pronounce the Y in Hebrew. You live in the modern southern kingdom of Judah. Guess what the Apaches called this place? They put the Y on it, just like the ancient Hebrews did. And it meant the people who lived up on high, the people up in the mountains. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountain. Top of the mountain. We are the modern southern kingdom of Judah. And so when you see this correlation, it is not accidental. We are on our 18th governor. In Ezekiel 17, it was the 17th and 18th governors who sold out their constitutional oath of office and made backdoor deals with Egypt to take resources and money. <clears throat> The guy's name was Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim. Jehoahaz was not good enough for Egypt. They were the puppet masters of Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim. And so Egypt came in and said, you need to put your little brother Jehoiakim in office to do what we want done next. And this guy and this guy came together in what year? 2017 in the year of the signs in the sky by 2020 these two guys would take 100 billion dollars in COVID money and launder it through the state of Utah in the name of health savings accounts and then in October of 2021 completely disappeared the money off the books you will never find it on the internet if you search a hundred billion dollars COVID money to Utah, guess what will happen in your Google? Do it. It's very interesting. You'll find a hundred billion dollars went missing and nobody can find it. Now, what's a lot of people will say to me, Morgan, you got to show me where that's at. I can't anymore. It's gone. I, I promise you I saw it. And so did many of us who worked on the lawsuit in 2020 relative to masks on kids. Brigham. We've seen it too. Yeah. It was on there for about a week. Unless you, uh, Governor Herbert actually addressed it in a press conference, and that's where we learned that it went through an industrial bank for health savings accounts. Now it's gone. Now, you could say, well, all right, I, I don't believe it, fine. These guys entered into a secret agreement with the Rockefeller Foundation to buy 500,000 rapid antigen tests without oversight from the legislature. Some of those tests were contaminated with COVID-19. Now, it's interesting, they line up with these two guys. And this guy got into office basically the same way that guy did. Oh, I can't do this. I'm really, I really want to, but we don't have time. I'll just give you one little piece. We'll stay late. <laughs> Do you know who came to office also nationally in 2017? Oh, that would be President Trump. Donald Trump. Who did he run against? Okay, who was her husband? You know. Okay, if you take the ancient northern kingdom of Israel and you start lining up the leaders of Israel, there's a guy named Ahab who marries a woman named Jezebel. <coughs> and Ahab turns the world, uh, the, the northern kingdom of Israel, to idolatry. And his wife turns Israel to child sacrifice. Wow. He will rob Naboth of his vineyard. Now, Naboth's vineyard 
was given Naboth of the Lord. Bill Clinton will rob Utah of the largest monument designation in the history of the United States from the Arizona side of the border, the Escalante Monument. Now, Bill Clinton and Ahab will serve the same amount of time in office. Once they leave office, Ahab dies, Bill Clinton dies politically. Their wives will rule in political office, not in the leadership, but from another territory. Hillary Clinton, after Bill leaves office, will go and rule from New York as a senator instead of from the capital. They'll serve the same amount of time. Now, the Lord raises up a guy, so you go Ahaziah, uh, Ahab, Ahaziah, Jehoram, Jehu. Now think about that. Here's Ahab, Ahaziah, Jehoram, Jehu. And the Lord calls Jehu out of the wilderness. And everybody knows Jehu because he drives like a madman. He says he drives his chariot furiously. The Lord will command a, uh, Jehu to fight the house of Ahab. Not Ahaziah, not Jehoram, but Ahab, uh, Jehu will fight primarily against Jezebel because Ahab dies. Donald Trump will not fight against Barack Obama or George W. Bush, but the modern Jezebel, whose husband has left office, and his job will be to put to rest forever the house of Ahab, just like Donald Trump, okay? <clears throat> Who do these two guys primarily support for the presidency over the king of Babylon who came to power in 2017? Not him. This guy will be in charge of elections in Utah, and will make many statements against Donald Trump in support of Joe Biden. Now again, I don't care who you like, I don't care who you support, but at some point in time you gotta stop ignoring coincidences and realize Utah has a prophetic destiny. As a result of their actions, the Lord says, that's it. I'm done with the Southern Kingdom of Judah. I will bring you down. Now, the guy who gets the revelation that Judah will be brought down is Josiah. And Josiah says to the Lord, am I going to have to be there when that happens? That's an interesting question, right? And the Lord says, Josiah, no, you will be gone by then. Guess who runs against that guy? Jonathan. That guy does. Who lines up with that guy? And that guy inexplicably loses to him and does not have to witness the greatest Gadianton takeover of the world, including Utah, that we've ever seen in the name of COVID-19. But these two guys will sell us down the river like no other during COVID-19. They will mask all of our children in school with a 0% death rate. They will close every church and every temple and issue martial law in the state of Utah. So, the Lord basically says, by Zedekiah, you're all dead. And he sends Babylon in. Babylon invades the southern kingdom of Judah and doesn't kill Zedekiah. They take all of his children and kill his children in front of his face and carry him away to Washington, D.C., i.e., Babylon, just like Ezekiel 17 says. So what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> What's all that mean? Two governors to go. Yeah, you got two governors to go. But but we're Utah, right? It's the headquarters of the Lord's church. How many saints respect that fact anymore? How many saints protected the church in 2020? How many members of the Utah legislature have done anything about 2020? How many of them have called for an audit of the Rockefeller money? How many of them have called for an audit of why we locked down schools when no children died? How many have called for an audit of COVID money? How many have asked for any accountability for the loss of our liberties in 2020? None, none of them. Why, why is that? How do you take a people 
enlightened by God, who spread the gospel to the whole world and create things like the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, temples, conference centers, ward buildings, stakes, and turn them into a people in this place who won't do anything about tyranny. How does that happen? And then what we do when that happens is we look at the church and we say it's their fault. That's worse. You see why that makes us in more trouble? The Lord gives us a sacred place. We turn away from his law. We let go of his kingdom. We exalt the church and tell them to do everything for us. Take care of our kids. Teach us doctrine. Send our kids on missions. Do all the pageants. We'll just give you this tithing money. You leave us alone. We'll go to the temple on occasion. And then the church gets subjected to an evil government, and all the people go, "Why? what were you doing? Why didn't you protect us? Why didn't you take, why'd you go get the shot? Why did you put on a mask? Why didn't you? And we go to church and we wonder, oh, look at them wearing a mask. Look at them not wearing a mask. Did he get vaccinated? Did she not? <laughs> why, why in the world would we worry about that? We're the ones who allowed it to happen. So when that occurs, let me show you one more thing. Once something like that occurs, <coughs> How safe are you? This is a National Geographic article from 1958. The title of the article is called Geographical Twins, A World Apart. This is the Jordan River in Israel. It's the Jordan River in Utah. The Dead Sea, the Great Salt Lake. This is a map of the Dead Sea, the Great Salt Lake, Jericho and Jerusalem, Salt Lake City, Freshwater Sea of Galilee, Freshwater Utah Lake, both separated by an approximately 60 mile river called the Jordan River. That's just a coincidence. Brigham Young planned that. <laughs> and we didn't even get to pick the name. We wanted to name it Deseret, and the Salt Lake Tribune and Congress were like, nope, you're going to be called Judah. That way you can never make anything out of it religiously. <laughs> That's how dumb the enemies of the Lord are. So here we are in the modern southern kingdom of Judah. The story's all there. We match the kings. We even match the judges of Israel. This is the first judge of the reign of the judges. These are the last two judges. Okay, if you don't read your Bible right, you're going to think Samson's the last judge. But once Samson dies, Samuel is called the judge of Israel. His sons become the judge of Israel. And it's Joel and Abijah who rule together as the judges of Israel that causes Israel to say, no more. Your sons are losers. Give us a king. The first judge is the lion of the Lord. The first territorial governor is the lion of the Lord. And they match line for line. And then we match <coughs> governor to king. We match by name. We match by geography. President Hinckley stands up in front of the entire church in the year 2000 and says the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 2 has been fulfilled in Salt Lake City, Utah because it is from the pulpit in Salt Lake that the word and the law of the Lord go forth. So look at Isaiah chapter two. Now, this is the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Utah and Salt Lake City in the latter days. <clears throat> And in the latter days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established in a place called the top of the mountains, right there, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all the nations shall flow unto it, and many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Where is the house of the God of Jacob headquartered with a capital of God's people? Salvation. There's only one place. And from Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. 
and he shall judge among the nations. This is our missionaries. We send our missionaries out to rebuke people, to teach them to beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, hooks and to not make war anymore. We teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ. But look what happens. Just like Ezekiel says, they forsake the Lord, or the Lord forsakes us. And why? Because we are replenished from the East, took $100 billion from Washington, D.C., and laundered it in a Gadian conspiracy through the state of Utah. Thank you. Um, will it fit? Okay. And then he says, so now Isaiah is go go, going to go on to describe the problems. He says, your land is full of gold and silver. You worship idols. You have many cars. You, uh, your mean man boweth down. The great man humbleth himself. Therefore, forgive them not. And that's an interesting terminology we can't cover tonight. But look at what's going to be the signal of the fall of the people in that space. Now, understand, I don't place any of this on the Lord's mouthpieces. Doesn't have anything to do with them. The Lord's not going to punish us because of the prophets. He's going to punish us because we didn't listen to the prophets and we didn't follow his rules. So he'll notice the words he begins to use. Enter into the rock. You will be humbled, your lofty looks. What's he describing? High mountains lifted up. Haughtiness of men brought low. What can take something on high and bring it low? An earthquake. So, to go into the, uh, all of this, he says, we'll go into the clefts of rocks, into the tops of the ragged rocks. How do you, how do you get things down low up high and things up high down low? It says, the Lord and the glory of his majesty will arise to shake terribly the earth. Now, if we had had an earthquake recently in Utah, I'd be really worried. Especially if it was a really big earthquake, an unprecedented size that did something like shook the temple and knocked Moroni's trumpet out of his hand. If that happened, I'd be deathly afraid. Thank goodness it did not. So we're okay. Now, interestingly, there's a scripture on point with that. And the Lord promises in the Doctrine and Covenants that the last troubles or kind of the wind up of the troubles is going to start where? In his house. Anybody know the chapter? DNC 112. He says, Upon my house shall it begin. I think I actually got it right there. Upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord. A day of wrath, a day of desolation. Spring equinox which is the beginning of a new year is March 19th. On March 18th, the day before the spring equinox, that guy loses his trumpet. What does the trumpet mean? The trumpet is a symbol of something that will occur. Call, uh, the gospel, forth, the gospel the going gospel forth to all, all the nations, nations proclaiming the restoration of the gospel. This is the Salt Lake City earthquake. This is a two week government map of the seismic sensors across the United States and Canada. From my house it shall go forth, right? And upon his house it shall begin. The Salt Lake earthquake on March 18, 2020 was the fourth largest earthquake in the history of Utah. The Bluffdale earthquake created about 900 aftershocks in two months. The Salt Lake earthquake created 2,000 aftershocks in two weeks and it was a 5.4 and it knocked the trumpet out of Moroni's hand and it shook the entire promised land from the Lord's house in the mountains. After that event, a solemn assembly was called in which President Nelson read a proclamation of the restoration of the gospel from the sacred grove. He read Moroni's trumpet 
from the sacred grove. It's like he picked it up, went to the place it all started, and gave us a warning straight out of Jeremiah chapter 4. Now, do you remember what the prophet did six months later in women's conference? My wife knows. He said to prepare places of safety. Of safety physically and spiritually. Now look at Jeremiah chapter 4. Declare ye in Utah, publish in Salt Lake City, blow Moroni's trumpet in a solemn assembly, and tell the women of the church to prepare places of safety. Set up your standard towards Adam on Diamond. Get out. Don't stay. Because the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. The Assyrian. So right there. You see those things happen. What does it mean? Now you might say, no, Jeremiah, he was, he was the guy at Lehi's time, right? He was a prophet to Judah. Was he? Who we got any scriptorians in here? What's the famous scripture mastery from Jeremiah chapter 1? Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the goyim. That's the Hebrew word. Goyim means Gentiles. Jeremiah was not ordained as a prophet to Judah. He was ordained a prophet to us, the Gentiles, who would make up the modern-day southern kingdom of Judah in the promised land of the United States of America. And Jeremiah says, when you see that trumpet blown in Judah in a solemn assembly and a call to go into the defense cities, you better start to set up your standard to the place we were all meant to go back to. And you got to figure that out in your own head, right? I, I don't have the right to sit up here and tell you how you do that. That's up to you. Now, here's where it becomes really interesting. If the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way, then we should be able to use the moment in 2020 in which the solemn assembly is held to identify the movements of a potential Assyrian. And when you study ancient Assyria, Assyria is not what a lot of people think it is. A lot of people think of Assyria as Syria today, but Syria today was a vassal of the Assyrian Empire. So when we go over here and we take a look at where Israel was, right over here, and we look at where Syria was, or Damascus, Assyria was here. And in the history of Assyria, the Assyrian king is chronically having problems with this group of people called the Scythians up here. And so the king of Assyria will marry off his daughter to the Scythians of the Northeast so that he can then turn his attention to Syria or Damascus because Syria has entered into political and economic relations with the Northern Kingdom of Israel, which is America today. Can you think of a country that lies to the south and west of another country that has gotten into trouble with their overlord who is to the north and east because they entered into political and economic relations with western states. Guess who the Scythians become? The Slavic people and the nation of Russia. Now if we go up and we look at Russia, there is a place, I'm not going to get it right, to the south west of Russia that entered into political relations with the United States and the West and got into hot water. And for that, Russia invaded them and is still to this day bombing them. Now, if it followed the pattern 
of ancient Syria, the king of Assyria in retribution against Rezin, <clears throat> the king of Damascus, would bomb the home city or destroy the home city of, of Pekka, no, it's Rezin, Rezin of Damascus. When Putin goes into the Ukraine, Putin purposefully targets Zelensky's hometown and bombs it, just like the king of Assyria did to Rezin's hometown. Um, so, you know, you go to Jeremiah and you start to read Jeremiah now, and you start to read Jeremiah from the perspective of our day, and Jeremiah becomes far more meaningful for our time. And Jeremiah will talk about practical ways that you can deal with what is coming. And in fact, Jeremiah will give this wonderful admonition to the men of the world. He will refer to these men as watchmen. And Jeremiah will basically say, if you don't become one, you're probably going to die. And your wife and your kids are going to look back at your legacy of not protecting them and are going to flee to Zion for safety without you. So I don't know about you, but when I started to comprehend that, I love my wife. And I have five kids. My oldest is 20 to 20, hun. My youngest is 13. They will never have the chance to prepare for what is coming. And I have not. Left them a legacy of preparedness. The Lord talks about men like me who don't repent. He says, you will sit upon the ground and curse God and die. Men, that's you. You will get your act together now or the Lord will kill you off because you are not worthy to go to Zion if you are so buried in the world that you have not prepared a place for your wife and children. I didn't want to be that guy. So in 2020, I undertook to seriously repent and to change my life significantly. And I began to study these things because you know, you know how the Lord promises to speak to us? I will reveal it to you in your hearts and minds. And we get rid of the mind part, or we get rid of the heart part, and we don't take both witnesses. We don't go into the scriptures and say, Lord, what should I do? And we just think he's magically going to dump revelation into us. <clears throat> well, what about Oliver Cowdery, right? Who the Lord says, you took no thought, save it were to ask. How many of us men have sat down and read these things and said, I see that I must become a watchman, and therefore I will go learn what it means to be a watchman and not just sit around waiting for the Lord to pour magic information into my mind. Well, the Lord says there shall be a day that the watchman upon Mount Ephraim, that's here, right here in the state of Utah, you're in the mountains of Ephraim, shall cry, Arise, let us go to Zion. So who's crying for that? <clears throat> You think you're going to go to general conference and hear somebody over the pulpit say it's time to go? Or is it the watchmen who cry, let us go? And the Lord says, sing with gladness for Jacob. Shout among the chief of the nations. Who's the chief of the nations? The Goyim, the chief of the Gentiles today is the United States of America. Behold, I will bring them from the north. And here's where you get the first clue as to how to get a watchman. I will gather them from the coasts of the earth. That word appears many times in the scripture in reference to people who take a man in the order of ancient Israel and appoint him to be a captain over ten or a hundred or a thousand. And the Lord says, I will bring them. The, the term in Hebrew is from among the people. That's what the coasts of the earth means in Hebrew. So I will gather them from among the people with them. Now, who's, who's causing this? 
The instigator of this event is the watchman. The watchman says it's time to go. So the Lord says, I will bring them. And I will gather them from among the people with the blind, the lame, the woman with child. Notice he doesn't mention any men here. There's no men. It's not the scared man, not the man who hands the gun to his wife, not the man who didn't honor his priesthood. He does include the women. And her that travails. Who is that? It's Revelation chapter 12. The woman in travail is the church. We've got it the other way around. We're not creating places of safety to preserve our families in the church. We're expecting the church to create the places of safety. And President Nelson said the opposite. And it's the men who create the places of safety in response to their wives who ask them to, because the men aren't doing it, that they create a way to escort the church to the place. And we put it backwards. Ezekiel finishes, I shouldn't say finishes, you really have to study DNC 101, 103, and 105. But in Ezekiel, he says, here's how you get a watchman. Son of man, speak to the children of thy people when I bring the sword upon the land. Did the sword hang over America in 2020? If it did, that's your sign to take a man from among you and to set him as your watchman. Now the Book of Mormon talks about this. It says in times of righteousness, the Nephites had a tradition of doing what? Setting men as their captains who had the gift of prophecy and revelation. When 10 men get together in a spirit of cooperation and appoint one man to be their captain, you will always get a man of prophecy and revelation when the 10 men all have the gift of prophecy and revelation. And those men will never steal money from each other or use force to prop up anti-Christ government schools. They will never take a tax base and arrest you if you don't pay it. So if you can't find nine men like that, we hearken all the way back to the beginning of this presentation to Lot. Can't find ten good men who won't kill you if you don't pay into the system or let the police come and take you if you don't. And you create a group of ten. And those men become the watchmen of the land. And those men prepare to call upon the people Right? It says, when he seeth the sword come upon the land, blow the trumpet and warn the people. How many of the elders and high priests of the church are out warning the people? Yeah. Zero. I mean, we let our state become subject to Gaddy and robbers in 2020. We let our children <clears throat> be masked in school for nothing is literally a zero percent death rate so what do we do well you prepare places of safety you start following the prophet all right i'm gonna stop there and uh that way you got a little time to ask question correct me or we leave <laughs> not good with any of the above so, sure. Well, this question is a little out there. So you can, you're, I'm totally fine if you say that's a subject for another time. But I'm wondering if you are able to speak to us about Noahide law. What law? Noahide. I don't even know what it is. It, describe it to me a little bit. It's apparently based on um, uh, traditions that aren't biblically based but they've evolved it within certain sects of Judaism. Okay. And Noahide laws are apparently something that have been signed into effect with Jimmy Carter by every single president. Okay, and so now I know how to speak to them. <laughs> okay, you ready? Okay. Don't. Don't do it. Don't get into any of that. Here's why. We have developed, so sovereign citizenship, you could start uh, the, the supposed orders signed by President Trump. I could take you down any path 
that represents legal recourse for wrong. Okay, is that what these are? Um, How to exercise no. your no? Okay. These are hidden laws that apparently are part of the secret combinations that uh, okay. give permission to certain people that get into positions of power to then persecute Christians for not abiding. By okay. I don't okay. know if that rings a bell. No, it does. Okay. okay, here's why. In the Book of Mormon, you learn of, who do I get the credit for this? Somebody, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, and I need to give them credit for it. Um, oh, good grief. Okay, the Book of Ether. Where did the Nephites dig up the secret combination laws? It's from the, there's 24 plates. What's the color of the plates? The 24 plates. They're gold. Now, the Mormon says, we're not, I'm not going to write them all. They contain a record from Adam to uh, the time, what does he say? To the time of Joseph, I think. Or to the time of the tower. That's what he says. It's a record of the creation of the world to the time of the tower. And those contain the workings of the secret combination. So how, in, okay, if we take a look at records, copper plates have been found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, brass plates, Nephi had. <clears throat> when we rank these in order of like celestial, terrestrial, celestial, gold plates become the gold standard, the celestial laws. So when you hear that there are gold plates, you should perk up. There's only two people who we know created gold records. Jaredites and Nephites. And we know the Jaredite record precedes the fall of the tower. And we only have one other reference in all scripture to what those could possibly be. You know where it's at? Moses chapter 6 and the Pearl of Great Price. Oh, it's Brad. Brad Griffin is the one who told me about this. He's the one that brought this to my attention. Um, Moses chapter 6. Look at verse 5. And a book of remembrance was kept. I would be willing to bet that the 24 gold plates of the Jaredites are that original book, which contain the workings of Cain and the first secret combination upon the earth. Upon which, now we go to the Book of Mormon, and, and there's this epistle written to Moroni where they invoke this ancient order and say, join us, we are of ancient origin, come become our brothers. There are rules in the combination. And if the rules of the combination are followed, power is given by their master who is the devil. Now go to Ether chapter 8. And you are told what to do about the revelation you have that they exist. Okay? Okay, first of all, here's the guy you want to watch. This is the hidden gem in the book of Ether. Okay, Omer means the, um, I'm, I'm going to say it wrong, the shaft of wheat, the I can't remember the right word. So, Omer is taken into captivity. And then you get this story about Jared and the account on the record concerning the secret plans that you can use to obtain kingdoms and glory. So they're following rules to obtain kingdoms and glory. And one of the rules is you have to operate within the rules of agency. You, you can take things, that's true. But if you follow the laws of agency and administer the secret combinations to the people, then you will get power and gain and be able to murder, plunder, lie, and commit all manner of wickedness and whoredoms. 
Now, watch how this unfolds. Do we care generally? I don't mean you specifically. As a country, do we care that congressmen are engaged in whoredoms? We still elect them. Do we care that they plunder us? How many trillions of dollar in debt are we? We don't care. Do we care that they lie? We don't. Do we care when they murder? Yes, if it's American citizens. We don't care if you kill other people, okay? So when the military industrial complex murders entire countries, we don't care. But when you kill an American, a citizen, then we invoke what? The law of due process. What about abortion? Uh, abortion. See, here's why I'd say I, I really appreciate that, but we've all got to understand that that is the lowest hanging fruit of murder. And we can't even grapple with the lowest hanging fruit as a people. We see that and we're like, half of America's like, that's not murder. So the fact that we can't see that is why we can't see what I'm about to show you next. Once you administer the oaths to all the children in public schools and high schools, then the righteous begin to go down into the secret combinations. They turn against the Ten Commandments. Public schools teach them not to worship God, to covet what their neighbors have, and to go to college to make more money and worship money. Once you've gone through that system and graduated, you want to buy, get a 30-year mortgage, buy a great big house, and live in Alpine and drive a really nice car and be a lawyer or a doctor. And if you're not one of those things, we don't hold you up high as much as we do the people who do graduate from the satanic institutions with a knowledge of the oaths. And so when all the politicians turn to the oaths, including in our cities right here, we're like, look, that's good. We don't really like it, but just don't murder any of us because everything else you can do directly, but we create mechanisms of murder by degrees of separation. So now, how do you commit a secret murder in Alpine, Utah, or let's take for a better example, in Davis County, Utah? You give the power to kill to somebody else. You teach them how to arm themselves and defend themselves because all citizens are a threat. You then teach them by policy not to de-escalate traffic stops, but to escalate them. And then when they kill somebody, you have government immunity to say it was a justified killing, which is what it's gonna be. Or they'll get some minor censure. And we all go, that wasn't us. That was the police. <clears throat> no, you hired the police. You empowered the police. You elected the people who created the force you are responsible for the death. You can't pass it off to somebody else. But because it's a secret murder, right? I'm over here, I don't have to hear about it. The news show comes on, I turn the channel, it was those guys, la 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 la. That's what we do. Don't pay, if you don't pay your taxes, what's gonna happen to you? They will come and possess your property. And if you resist in the name of conscience or religious belief because a secret combination is running the American government and you use your second amendment right to defend your first amendment right and your property they will They'll kill, kill you. you so don't do that right but your neighbors will say well you should have just paid your taxes render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's because I don't understand what that means so I'm just going to say it to you because I don't want to be like Jesus I want to pretend to be like Jesus on Sunday at church and six days a week do whatever I want well, they're taking my house. Well, then I guess you should have paid your taxes. Okay? Yeah, you probably should, or they're going to kill you. And who's killing you in all of these instances? Your neighbors. By degrees of separation, it is your neighbors who have institutionalized these processes so that you don't have to evict your neighbor. So, Morgan, the, the Book of Mormon warns us to not let the secret combinations get above us, but... Uh, where do you go when there is no place to go outside yeah. that, that system? So, um, there, this is not, this is not an, um, you don't, don't, 
<laughs> Don't listen to me, okay? Don't take anything I say as something you should do. I would propose to you that that's that he invokes this concept. He says, when you see these things, then awake to your awful situation. And in the very next chapter after <clears throat> Mormon gives this great dissertation on secret combinations and awaking, you get the story of Omer, who flees out of the land as a father with his family. Then, well, I, won't, I won't go there. Study 3 Nephi chapter 5, I think it is, where Mormon warns you when you see these things. He says, I am a descendant of Lehi, who left Jerusalem, who was a father, and nobody knew it except for the fathers that God let out. So there's your first hint, right? Now, the, the problem that we have, I, the problem that I have, okay, is I can look back at my life and I have all this baggage from my life, from the practice of law. You know, when we won the Bundy cases, the US Department of Justice began to meddle in our lives. They tapped our phones, they went after our bar licenses, uh, they messed with our cases, and all I can think about sometimes as a man and a father and a husband is all the messes that follow you in life, right? And your, your temptation is to turn and face, you know, the 30 year mortgage. I got to keep a job. I got to put food on the table. I know I don't have to drive a nice car, but man, it really is nice to drive a nice car, right? And you have to take all that stuff and boil it all down to what you actually have to do and you only have to do one thing what is it come follow me die, come to die. Christ. the rule of this world is death like and answer. once you get comfortable with that there is nothing they can take from you or do to you and you can take everything you have and walk away and you can walk away 50 times because you're just not playing that game. And what ends up happening is you begin to walk away, right? For me, it was walking away from everything that Alpine Utah represented in my life. <clears throat> and the farther away you go, the less you have until you have nothing except your conscience and the obligation to die. And what's gonna happen in my life is if I have you know the right spouse she'll follow with me and love me and my kids like Nephi will follow their father and the Lord will lead us to a promised land but I can't tell you how to do that and I can't give you the courage to walk away you have to go earn that yourself and then when you do we will see each other somewhere And when we see each other at that place, Isaiah says we will fall upon each other's necks and kiss each other and hug each other and sing songs unto the Lord. That's the only safe place left. And you study that place, and it's all over the scriptures. Yeah. Can you talk about, um, this is entitled A Full Land of All Nations. Can you go into that and... and I've, I've actually read that scripture so many times I completely forget to cover it. <laughs> so, in uh, in 2020, when when I'm like kind of going, oh my gosh, this is it. I I start to think, oh, what am I going to do? And I get a little frenzied, and I have this mythological belief in my head that the elders of Israel will stand up and save the Constitution. Right, we've all heard that. And I started to study that statement. And it's not what we think it is. We have a mythology built up around it. And, and then when I came to this verse in particular, as I was studying the events of the last days, I go to DNC 87. And DNC 87 is the prophecy on the Civil War. 
So you go through this and it says, wars that will shortly come to pass beginning at the rebellion of South Carolina. Now we all know what that is, right? And that war will terminate in the death of many souls. Okay? End of story. <laughs> and he'll give one more paraphrase to that war to describe what comes next. Behold, okay, so, and the time will come that war will be poured out upon all nations beginning at this place. Now, if you don't understand English and grammar, you get lost there. The Lord does things for a reason. And he concludes the narrative of this war in order to open up and, and uses it to describe the type of war that will be poured out upon all nations. So he uses the civil war as an example of a type of war in which the southern states divide and call on other nations. Now that's an entangling alliance. It's a secret combination. And the reason it's a secret combination is because the law of Israel is that you must not wage preemptive war. You can't enter into an alliance to go to war against your friend's enemy. You follow the Lord's law of war. And the Lord says, turn the other cheek. And it's my desire that you turn the cheek like three times. And then on the fourth time, I think it is, he says, then I'll justify you in going to war. So basically an entangling alliance, secret combination type of industrial warfare will emerge after the civil war. And in fact, the Southern states will try to enter into a secret combination with Great Britain to win. And then he says, at that time, war shall be poured out upon all nations. And after the Civil War, what you see is industrial warfare, big war, bombs, big guns, big ships, big armies, lots of killing, uh, till we get to today, remote killing. And now here's where we get it, and it came to pass. In other words, time passes. After time passes, after many days, slaves shall rise up against their masters. Now, you don't have to go any farther than China to see this. You've got people right now in China living in 15 minute cities and citizens risking their lives to get video out of China to show us what is happening in China. Now, when China goes to war and when Russia go to war, those slaves will rise up and they have tried already in 2020. Before COVID hit, there were videos coming out of China of dry ice COVID bombs inside subways and people rioting in Hong Kong because they were trying to rise up. And from that point, China just locked that country down. And then it shall come to pass that the remnants who are left from that scenario will become angry and will vex the Gentiles. So everybody's going to turn against us. And thus, with the sword and by bloodshed. Now that, now we like to live in a fantasy land. We like to forget that Revelation 18 says that by violence shall Babylon be thrown down. We like to ignore this, that by sword and bloodshed, the inhabitants shall <coughs> mourn by famine, plague, earthquake, thunder, fierce and vivid lightning. Shall the inhabitants of the earth be made to feel the wrath and indignation and chastening hand of an almighty God until the consumption decreed hath made a full end of all nations? Now, what does all include? America. America. So if you're fighting to prop up America in some notion of patriotic sense of duty and the Lord is bringing it down, you are fighting the Lord. When the Lord says it's over and tells you to get out, you get out or stay at your peril. What is the default? Flee. Everywhere in scripture, get out, flee, get out, flee, get out. Stay not, retire. And so if you're gonna go against the default, right? So if I were to say to you, should you get baptized? What's the default? 
And if you say, well, I need to pray about it. I'm like, well, have you read the scriptures? Yeah, but I need an answer. So reason is not good enough for you. You need a divine manifestation and sign to follow the default. Yeah, I need that. Okay. I mean, the Lord is merciful. He'll probably give it to you because he wants you to be baptized. But you don't need it. So when you read the scriptures and they tell you what to do and you're like, nah, that doesn't apply to me. <laughs> what? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. But, you know, if that's what you think, that's great. What I would probably do is I'd look at the default and I would say, well, I, I really feel like the default is not for me. I'm going to take it to the Lord and see if the Lord will excuse me from the default. And then the Lord can say, yeah, I need you to be right down in the heart of Salt Lake City where the bomb is going to drop. You know, I'm just kidding. It's probably not. You know? But, you know, I sure wouldn't want to go there by default. But if the Lord told me to, I would. I don't even know why I said all that. I don't remember the original question. I just talk lots and lots sometimes. Oh, the scripture. Thank you. When you mentioned get out, is yeah. there a reference to a place? Uh, stand in holy places. Now, a lot of people say, well, and I, I agree, that is a temple. That's true. That could be your stake, yes. But in 2020, when COVID hit, if you had run to the temple, what would have happened? You couldn't go in. It's closed. So what I would encourage you to do, a holy place is a place in covenant with God. And if you can get the Lord to covenant your place and protect it, you are in a holy place. If you're guessing, if you think, you know, because somebody visited the area once and said it was a place of refuge, that's not a covenant with the Lord. That's not personal revelation. Go get your own personal revelation and get a Lord to put a covenant upon your home and family. That's a holy place. And then study the default. Will you show the, the fathers leaving all those different, I mean, we all know Lehi. Can you go? I don't know I if like, I have that slide. I, um, I put together a slide. Mm -hmm. I don't know where it Sorry. is. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> I put together a slide of all the different prophets and fathers who had been commanded to get out. And it's everywhere. Like the scriptures are just filled with fathers commanded to flee the land. And when I saw that, I mean, it was like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Lehi, uh, Mosiah, Alma. Brother and Jared. yeah, it, Jared, you're just like, what? I mean, it sounds really dumb, like, but you're like, what is the Lord trying to tell me? Yeah. <laughs> kind of obvious. Let, I will show you this. Let me show you this one. Oh, I don't know if I should show this. What time is it? Six. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's 6.30. <laughs> so, I, let, me try, let me try something. Don't let me forget to go to Mormon's word, words in 3rd Nephi 4, okay? Because I'm gonna go down a path and I'm gonna forget <laughs> where I was going. Uh, go to the New Testament. No, we gotta start in 3rd Nephi. So we don't have to remind you? Yeah, don't, okay. rem don't well, <laughs> remind me to do the end. And, okay. okay. Now, when did we celebrate the new millennium? Uh, why did we do that? Uh, a date. Why would we celebrate January 1, 2000 as a new millennium? Because no. we count the calendar. <laughs> we were a year off and everybody knows it. Now, if you don't know it, it's just because you haven't thought about it for a second. Year 1 is 1 AD. Year 2000 is 2000 AD. That means 2001 is the first year of the new millennium and we should have been celebrating New Year's Eve of the new millennium on December 31, 2000. And instead we celebrated and we partied like it was 1999. Even Prince, everybody got it wrong. 
How does the whole world get the new year wrong? Or the Lord puts a stupor over the people for his purposes to align us to his calendar, which is why President Hinckley gets up in 2000 and has a solemn assembly from Palmyra and a second solemn assembly in October of 2000 to dedicate the conference center and invokes the language of a new millennium in the wrong year. And by doing so, our calendar is corrected to match the Book of Mormon. In the Book of Mormon, in the 18th year, okay, which would be what for us? 2017. Something causes the Gadiant robbers to get all stirred up and to start to expose themselves. In the latter end of 2017, did the Gadiant robbers get all stirred up and start to expose themselves? Because yeah. Donald Trump came to office. And then, by the 21st year, which would be what for us? 20. 2020, the Gadiant robbers, did I get that right or backwards? In the 21st year, which would be our 2020, that's our 21st year of the new millennium, because of the mistake, did we have a siege on the world economy that cut us off from our outward privileges? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Exactly like the Book of Mormon. Now, because of this event, because of what happens in the 21st year, Mormon says all the living souls repented. What's a living soul? A person converted or who has the breath of God breathed into their soul. That's what, remember when he says Adam had the breath of God breathed into him and he became a living soul. And they knew these living souls because of this siege that happens in the 21st year knew that Christ had come. And he had that what, what they mean is he had uh, been born into the world and was about to start his ministry. Now, because of all this, Mormon then says they forsake all their sins, and he describes everything that happens up through the 22nd year. It's a little confusing because he says, and thus, in other words, what he just described, concludes the 22nd year, so 2021. And then he says the 23rd, 24th, and 25th year passed away. He doesn't give us any detail. He just takes three years and disappears then. He gives us one hint, too, as to how to reconcile this disappearance of time. He says, great and marvelous things happen in the time of living souls okay who in scripture talks about living souls great and marvelous events and book of mormon prophets won't touch his work john the revelator so if we can go to john the revelator and find these words and relevant prophecies then i would say mormon is probably doing this on purpose so we go to Revelation 15. There was a sign, great and marvelous. We saw a sign. Did we then have great and marvelous plagues poured out upon the world shortly after the sign? If so, we know what the great and marvelous plagues are. The first one is a vial that is noisome and grievous and is a sore. Now this is 16th century English. So a sore, according to Isaiah and Webster, is an affliction. So whatever the first vial is, it has to be a noisome <clears throat> affliction. So if I go to Webster's 1828 dictionary and I look up the word noisome, it gives an example of what a noisome thing is, and it says, such as a noisome effluvia. What's an effluvia? It's a flu. So the first vial is an affliction that is flu-like or noisome. Have you seen an affliction that is flu-like? 
and grievous and afflicts you. Okay, if you have, then the second plague, and if you love English, this is your verse. The second angel poured out his vial upon the sea. Now, look at that word right there. There's the living souls, just like Mormon talks about. What is a living soul doing in the sea? Who rises up out of the sea? The dragon does, and the beasts do. So why would a living soul be in the dominion of the beast? And if a living soul is in the dominion of the beast, do you think that that living soul is in danger of dying a spiritual death? So if you're a living soul in the dominion of the beast, there will be a vial that contains a poison that when it is put into you, becomes as the blood of a dead man. Can you think of a vial used to go into people living in the dominion of the beast that killed them? That's the second vial. The third vial is poured out upon the, the fountains of fresh water, okay? Have you seen anything poisonous lately poured into fountains of fresh water? It's just all there, like exactly in order. And Mormon basically says, hey, I can't tell you about these three years. All I can tell you is great and marvelous things happen and there are living souls around. By the way, you can read about those in the book of Revelation, which we won't talk about in the book of Mormon, but that's just an accident. So don't pay attention to that. So is that the forever chemicals that we're talking about too? Yeah. That I mean, you've got, you've got a riverway in the eastern United States that touches almost the entire eastern seaboard of fresh water that got polluted with a chemical that kills people. That, maybe that's not the thing. Maybe it's just a type and sign of the thing, but we should not be ignorant of the types and signs that are trying to wake us up to the events. So Mormon will then say, you know, we go back to Mormon now. If, if I'm correct and Mormon is trying to give us a hint of what is supposed to be <clears throat> happening, then Mormon basically tells you what to do next. So once the living souls repent, and once these great and marvelous things happen, Mormon, remember those oddities in scripture, the weird things. Mormon interjects the narrative and says this really odd thing. I am Mormon. We know that. I'm a pure descendant of Lehi. Well, God's no respecter of persons, Mormon, so who cares, right? You want to be like, what are you trying to tell me here? I have reason to bless my God and my Savior that he brought our fathers out of the land and no one knew it, save the people he brought out. Why would Mormon tell you that right here? And then he says, Surely shall he again bring a remnant of the seed of Joseph, which you are, to the knowledge of the Lord their God. There is only one way to achieve the knowledge of the Lord God. It is to see him. When you study the scriptures, when people come to a knowledge, they are brought into the presence of the Lord. Okay, what did President Nelson say <clears throat> last year? Part the, veil. the yeah. veil. That's a pretty unprecedented statement from a prophet of the church. And where do we get an instance in which all the people are invited to an event in which the Lord will be revealed in person? Moses. Yeah. Adam on Dan. Use the Book of Mormon. Third Nephi, chapter 11. Bountiful. Bountiful. There are two words in the Book of Mormon that are English words for place names. One of them is bountiful. Now, can you think of any other place or person given an English name in the Book of Mormon? 
There's only one. What is that? Desolation. Desolation. Notice any similarities <coughs> between those two words. Which one did the seed of Joseph arrive at? That one. Which one ended in the ruin of an entire people? Which one is the place that people were invited to to see the Savior? This one is a temple site on the American continent where Christ appears to a remnant of Joseph has a sacrament meeting and opens the heavens to heal and bless people with unspeakable things. What did I just describe? Adam on Dion. Okay? There is a doctrine of bountiful and how to get there in the Book of Mormon. But you have to study and you have to get the Spirit or you will not see it. Now, why would that word be used? Watch, watch this. Rob K is an amazing teacher who goes by the name of Mormon Yeshiva on, the, on YouTube. He um, has insights like almost nobody I've ever met. And he will talk about how to understand place names and words and meanings in the Book of Mormon and in scripture. And in ancient rabbinic teaching, Rob says that to understand the meaning of a word, you have to go to the first place the word appears in scripture. So if we do that, and we type in the word bountiful in scripture, and we do a search for that word, and we narrow it down, sorry, to the scriptures, we're gonna see, now watch, watch what happens. It's bounty. You will not find the word bountiful in the Old Testament. You will not find the word bountiful, if I remember right, yeah, you'll find bountifully in the New Testament, but not bountiful. Go to the Book of Mormon. First appearance of the word bountiful is in a chapter heading, so that doesn't really help us. <clears throat> the first time we see the, the word used in verse is 1 Nephi 17, verse 6. And bountiful is called bountiful on the other side of the ocean, not in America, because of its much fruit. Where is the place originally in scripture of much fruit? Eden. Where's the Garden of Eden? You see how that works? They can't tell you the name. The Lord has commanded them to protect it. And in the last days, when you live in the time that Nephi saw, and you receive an apostolic blessing that all things can be made known unto you, you now get to know everything you ask for. The Lord will withhold nothing, because he wants you to be there. And all people are invited. And, you know, the, even the brethren are making this known. How many of you remember President Nelson's vivid dream? What are the three elements of the vivid dream? A woman, a large company, on a path. Jeremiah, you find watchmen leading a large company on a path with the woman to Zion just like in President Nelson's dream. Elder Bender will get up the next conference and tell us all, there's a parable about a marriage feast, and the Lord invites his people, and his people don't go. So he commands the people who show up to go out into the highways and bring in the strangers. So how many people think they are not invited here, and therefore won't go, and so the people who do will go out into the highways, just like in the Book of Mormon, 
where they go out through the night gathering everybody they can to say the Lord was here yesterday. He'll be back tomorrow. Come, please, everyone, come. Isn't that in the marriage feast? That's um, the, mar that's the, the marriage uh, feast, too. The Bednar talked about it? That's it, yeah. Talk? yeah. So, you know, like how many... Now, again, I'm in a place I have no idea where I got here. <laughs> You're supposed to go to some place. Let me ask you a question. Or else, or is it a specific place? What's that? Is desolation yeah. symbolic of everywhere else outside of... Yeah, there are, say, two churches only, right? There is only one end to choose. You can choose a bountiful ending or a desolate ending. You can choose to become the house of Israel and the remnant, or you can choose to die. And there is no promise for the people who aren't here. Only the remnant gets a promise in the final days. What was the name of that YouTube channel again? The Mormon Yeshiva, Y-E-S-H-I-V-A. Okay, I think I got 21 minutes. Is that Desolate, right? Morgan and Alma 22, Desolation and Bountiful are also mentioned. And one's to the north, about a day and a half's journey. And one's to the south? Describing. <laughs> yeah, I won't get going that I got you. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it. Wait, have more and, questions. Uh, go fight win. Thank you. I, yeah, thank you for What about the parable of the yellow dog or whatever? Okay, so that's a. That was. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I want to. I, I should give you one. I'm going to give you one reference, okay? And you take this. Take it from here. Take it from there. And it'll touch on the yellow dog. But you gotta. You gotta understand kind of this first. Um. If I were to come here tonight and I were to say, I am leading a remnant group of people to go and build the new Jerusalem, you would be like, that guy's going to get excommunicated, right? <laughs> Why? I don't have the keys. And we know that the keys to the building of the new Jerusalem and the gathering of Israel are in the 12. That's Doctrine and Covenants. So I'm not, you shouldn't act outside of your keys. As a father, you have the keys of the functions of fatherhood in your home. President Oaks gives a great talk on this called the Melchizedek Priesthood and the Keys. And so as a father, you know, if I, I can't draw. Okay, so this is America and just live with the fact that that's America, okay? <laughs> and here I am in Utah and here's Missouri. And I can go to the doctrine of the church in canon and find doctrine on that. I know where to go. But if I try to go there outside of my keys, then I don't have a promise from the Lord. I could get a job and go. I could feel like our family was supposed to go, but I guarantee you, you do not have the keys unless you are in the quorum to build up the new Jerusalem. <clears throat> so you're not going to build the new Jerusalem, you don't have the keys. But you could go for a million other reasons. So I go to the Book of Mormon and I search for a doctrine on what I can do. And in the Book of Mormon, there's a really interesting occurrence when Alma founds the church. Who founded the church in our dispensation? Joseph. And so when we look at Alma, Alma says that the church became general under the reign of judges. And general means common or public. So probably some form of Nephite 501c3 or corporation. And you don't put faith in 501c3s and corporations, you put faith in keys. So we're learning a lesson here that's important for our day. And in that time, the priests under Alma and Amulek were holding forth things 
which must shortly come relative to the Son of God. And the people inquired concerning the place where the Son of God should come because they were taught he would appear to them. So they're like, hey, the church is founded. Alma's the founder. He's sending out priests. By the way, we just learned that Jesus is coming to America. Alma, could you tell us where that's going to be? And Alma's answer would be bountiful. So the Nephites know in advance where to be. You do not have any record in the Book of Mormon of how you go from this. Now, remember how I told you about the Nephite calendar? And it starts to tell you what's going to happen year by year. So we go over to the Book of Mormon again and we pick up that narrative. Third Nephi chapter 6, verse, four, uh, verse 1. The economic siege upon the people ends in the 26th year, 2025. That's our 26th year of the new millennium. And then they get super rich and super prosperous for about two and a half years where people have their last chance to get out. And most people don't. They're like, sweet, I can move back to Alpine and buy a bigger house and a BMW because the Lord loves his people and gives us nice stuff. <laughs> and so most of the people do that, and they begin to prosper and wax great, and then watch what happens. In the 20 and 9th year, 2020, happens all over again. Riots, disputations, pride, ranking, lots of bureaucrats, lots of lawyers, um, and they get lifted up in pride, and in the 30th year, a great inequality develops such that the church is broken up in all the land. Which is our uh, 2029. 2029, the 100 year anniversary of the collapse of the American economies in the Great Depression that fell on a Jewish holiday comes to its 100 year anniversary on the same Jewish holiday in 2029. The same year the Book of Mormon says the church will be broken apart. Now here's the church made up of three things. Keys, a 501c3, and a corporation. These two organizations own more land in the United States than anybody else. And when the church gets broken apart, you think the masters of the Great Reset aren't going to take that from the church? and break apart that, and break apart that, leaving only this. And any saint whose testimony is invested in these things will not survive that event. Once that happens in the Book of Mormon, the apostles are scattered, they go out on the lamb, and they start to just teach. They start to get killed, arrested, persecuted, and the remnant is gathered out in that time and we learn nothing of how that occurs, except that fathers, according to Mormon, are called out and nobody knows it. But ignore that, right? because we think it's gonna be announced at conference for some reason, <laughs> which doesn't have any basis whatsoever in any doctrine or scripture. So, how do you know, right? And the lesson from Bountiful is you have this guy named Nephi, whose land of his nativity is Zarahemla. And all of a sudden, at the right time, Nephi is in the right place to hear the voice of the Lord as he descends from the sky after massive destruction. Now go study that massive destruction because all the Book of Mormon prophets, when they talk about the destruction that happens in 3 Nephi 11, they're not talking about 3 Nephi 11. They're talking about our day. They're using our precursors to teach the Nephites, or to, to, tell, to tell the Nephite story about their events, but they're not using the Nephite story. So like Jacob, when he describes the destructions, he's talking about the Gentile destruction. Nephi says there must come a vapor of darkness upon this land prior to the second coming. So where do you read about a vapor of darkness? 
in 3 Nephi chapter 10, 8, 9, and 10. And Nephi doesn't use that. But he should have, right? Because that one was really bad. Instead, Nephi uses the one that will come upon us. He says, in the flesh, and it must needs come. So you get a type and sign in the Book of Mormon. Um, and people okay. think it's spiritual darkness. Yeah, people it? think, he says it must needs come in the flesh upon this land. So we talking about a nuclear event? Um, can I, can we, um, like, the cameras? Yep. Okay. Now, it's okay, they heard. Yeah, they, <laughs> oh, that's true. By the way, I don't care if I know they hear it. Okay, I just don't want that hitting the internet and YouTube. Okay, because otherwise I won't talk like that anymore. It, that's why I do this this way, so that occasionally we can have that conversation. So, the Lord of Hosts. Remember where we are in Isaiah chapter two. In the last day, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established in the top of the mountains. Judah and Jerusalem, modern kingdom of Judah, state of Utah, modern Jerusalem is Salt Lake City, Utah. The Lord will take away from Salt Lake City the stay and the staff. What is the staff? It's the rod of authority. He's going to remove the Lord's capital to the place it's supposed to be, the covenant land, the covenant place, the Zion. He'll take away the stay, the whole staff of bread and the whole stay of water. Where do you find living water today? In the temple. What's the Lord going to take away from Jerusalem? The whole stay and the whole staff. Because it's got to go back to where it belongs. This is not the center place. Now that doesn't mean that this place won't be preserved. I'm not saying that, okay? But the Lord's going to put his capital where his capital belongs. He'll take away the mighty man, the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the prudent, the ancient. He'll take away the caucus system of the state of Utah because we'll give it away. That's where we got the caucus system was the Council of 50 under the territorial government of the state of Deseret, which was organized by the Council of 50. And we gave away the caucus system and under SB 54 and none of us ever did anything about it. And some of you did. People shall be oppressed, everyone by another, everyone by his neighbor. That's 2020. All your neighbors want to know why you're wearing a mask or why you're not wearing a mask. And we want to treat each other poorly because of our opinions on what you should be doing. And so Jerusalem is ruined. Salt Lake City's ruined. Utah has fallen because their tongues and their doings have been against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. The show. Now point to me. Where is your countenance? Point to it. Okay. The show of their countenance witnesses against them. They don't hide their sins as Sodom. They declare them. So we won't show you our face, but we will have a gay parade in Salt Lake City. Okay? We will be an idolatry. We will uh, embrace all the oppression that Lot had to suffer under an arbitrary and capricious government. So then he says... My people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. Lieutenant Governor of the state of Utah is woman. I don't care if a woman holds office. I'm just showing you Isaiah called the time. The mayor of Salt Lake County is a woman. The mayor of Salt Lake City is a woman. Again, I don't care. I'm just showing you Isaiah is calling the time frame. Therefore, the Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people. And we all say that's this is Jerusalem. We don't have to suffer any of the consequences of our idolatry. The Jews will. <laughs> that's insane. We interpose all punishment on the Jews in Jerusalem today, and we take all the righteousness and blessings. So what mean ye? Ye beat my people to pieces. That's a scripture you could go for an hour on. The Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion. Now, if Zion is a city for a, a Mount Zion in Missouri. Okay, that's the Doctrine and Covenants. It tells you specifically that the New Jerusalem will be built in Missouri and is called Mount Zion. So this is the mother. Here's mom. Mom is a place. Mom is a city. Mom is the center stake. Therefore, a daughter of a queen is a 
princess who exists over in the Rocky Mountains as the stake or capital of Zion temporarily in the refuge place. So here's the daughter of Zion. Now, Zara is princess or seed. He is Hephraim or Alephraim. Uh, so it could be the firstborn or the breath of God. There's the princess and seed. And um, Mala is salt. Okay? So what is a princess of a place? She is a city or a seed or a city of God of salt. Where is the modern salt city of God? Salt Lake City. What happens to the salt city of God in the Book of Mormon? It's destroyed. It's burned. And the people who know that is going to happen flee and go to Bountiful. So a daughter is a princess. And so when we read that the daughters of Zion are haughty, it means the stakes and the cities of the queen, the center place. They are in idolatry. The Isaiah will contrast temple dress with Babylonian dress in these scriptures. Babylonian dress is prideful, haughty, tinkling feet. And so the Lord will smite the crown of the head of the daughter. Where is the crown right now? Salt Lake City, Utah. A woman clothed with the sun, the crown upon her head of 12 stars, flees out into the wilderness to the place. So the Lord's going to smite the crown of the daughter, not the center place, to discover what? The secret combinations that exist in the state of Utah. And in that day, the Lord will take away the ornaments, the calls, the round tires, the chains, bracelets, bonnets, ornaments, the rings, the nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel, glasses, fine linen, hoods, veils, and it shall come to pass instead of sweet smell, there shall be a stink. Now, where do you get a sweet smell in ancient Israel? The incense of the temple. So if there's a stink, the temples are not burning incense, they're closed. 2020 again. And thy men shall fall by the sword in the war. It doesn't say the wars, it says the war. Now you start to put all these pieces together and you read exactly what's going to happen to Utah. And you just get to choose whether or not you believe that. And if you believe it, you have no excuse now. Right? Your only excuse is that Morgan Philpot is a nobody who, who doesn't have the right to tell you anything. That's true. That's true. But if it's true, or if you even think it is, you have a duty as a father to go home and learn these things for yourself and know for yourself if they are true. I hope I made a good argument <laughs> so that you'll at least go ask. And once again, I have no idea why I got here. <laughs> Can I ask you something else? Sure. Uh, really fast if you if you need to make it quick. Okay. But do you believe that the Antichrist is alive right now or, or do you think that it's someone who was on earth and is not and will return as there's a scripture somewhere that says something alludes to that in some way. Okay. This is hard to answer quick, but I'm going to try. No, we want to stay Okay. In order to understand something, you must study the doctrine of the thing. So, where do you find actual <laughs> reference in the Book of Mormon to an Antichrist and the Antichrist? Alma. Okay, Korahor. Alma. And Korahor, so I won't go into that because that doesn't answer your question, but study Korahor. Korahor is the antithesis of the Ten Commandments. And what Korahor is trying to teach us is that when you have a system that teaches covetousness and adultery, like modern public schools do, that's a Korahor. That's an antichrist. The other Korahor is really interesting because he
he is found at the very time you really want to find him in the Book of Mormon. Okay, where is he? I, I gotta spell it right or it won't. Okay, right there. Now, I understand that this is a reference, okay? It's the it's the it's the chapter heading. So let me go back real quick. I just want to verify something. Yeah. Okay. Jacob and Antichrist. Now again, this is a chapter heading, so take it for what you will, okay? Let's go down and find out who this guy is. Whoever this Jacob is, his people not only broke apart the church, but caused the destruction of the government of the land. Next, whoever this guy is, he is involved in secret combinations. He's probably the leader of the secret combination. And this secret combination, um, it says, which had brought so great iniquity upon the people that gathered themselves together and did place at their head a man whom they did call Jacob. Now, Jacob is who in scripture? An antichrist. Who is gathering right now? Who is also gathering? Mm -hmm. When this guy or this people turn away from being what they have been called to be and go back to being what they were before, after gaining knowledge of the thing, they become the thing that they were before they were enlightened and called. So an antichrist, have you ever heard of the concept of one mighty and strong? Who is the one mighty and strong? Now, Russell, Mary, and Nelson is Rossell, Marion, Nile's son. It's French. His whole name is French. Rosel is Rose. It's the masculine form of Rose. Marion is the masculine form of Mary. And Nile's son is the son of the nail. So find me a lady named Mary, who's married to the man of the nail, who has a daughter named Rose. And you find the Merovingian kings of French, who hide a conspiracy theory girl named Rose, who's supposed to be the son of Mary Magdalene, who was the wife of Christ. And you get into a crazy conspiracy theory that goes all the way back to a carpenter's son in Judea. Well, it's interesting that his name means basically the one mighty and strong. It's the champion or the son of the champion of the nail. Now, I don't think President Nelson's the one mighty and strong, but when you see the type appear, you should look for the one. And there is only one mighty and strong. Who is it? Jesus Christ. Okay. And does Jesus want sycophantic worshipers? Well, uh, sycophant is a person who just gets on their knees and bows down to power and greatness. He wants friends. He wants people to inherit what he knows. So he calls upon every single man to become the one mighty and strong of his own home. So who do you think the devil's going to call on? every single man to turn from his call as Israel to become an antichrist, to bring down the government of the land and to oppress the remnant of the people. It's the only way you could do it. Now, however, antichrists don't like sharing power. And so typically, unlike the Lord, you don't have consecration and equality in its true form. You have oppression and tyranny. So when you look for the Antichrist, he is one of the chiefest who had given his voice against the prophets who testified of Jesus. Now, where could that occur? Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. Twitter. You, the prophets live in Utah. Now, you could say every man's a prophet. But where in the Book of Mormon do we find people being taken and put to death secretly because of an antichrist. Zarahemla, the capital city of God's people. Now, I'm not saying that that means that the antichrist rises in Utah. 
But I also can't help but think about what we just talked about a little bit ago in the center of the Salt Lake Valley and how we have made ourselves kind of an important place on the national scene. So whatever happens with this, so I would say, yeah, he exists now. And more than likely you have three of them. You have the average man who is called into Israel, who turns from that and becomes one in his own neighborhood. You have arguably somebody vying for the governorship of Utah, who is one. And you have one on a national scale who is one, and one on a world scale who is one. So you could look for any one of those four. I would highly recommend you look for these two in Utah and in your own town. You don't need to look too far in your own town. It's a building where a bunch of kids go every day. <laughs> Sorry. If you're a teacher, I love you. It's not you I'm attacking. It's the place. It's the philosophy and the doctrine you are forced to teach. So, I don't, that's not a very good answer, but it's because I don't know who it is specifically. All right. Go to Revelations and pull out the Antichrist that's. The Antichrist in Revelation? Oh, okay. Are you sure? Oh, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I mean, if I'm really honest, I'm not very good with the Antichrist because I've tried to make him irrelevant in my life. I, because I made this decision, I would no longer participate in law and politics. And he's going to do what he's going to do he's in that realm. He's just another sign. He's just one of the check Well, signs. so the promise to the remnant is that you will be outside the reach of all these things. The Lord will basically take you and lead you to the center place. And so if you're living in that state where the Lord is upon your home, remember, because the promise is the Lord will be upon every dwelling place in every dwelling place as a uh, pillar of fire by night, cloud of smoke by day. So my question would be, you know, in your home, do you have the Lord upon your home? Because he promises it's one of the covenants of Israel in the last days. Let's go to that instead. So I'm, I'm going to try. Here, I will show you this. You know that Daniel <laughs> sees four beasts, right? What's the first? Well, the, you know the first three. A lion, bear. a leopard, and a bear. And a bear. And then Daniel doesn't describe the fourth. But Ezra, in 2 Ezra 11 and 12, does. And the Lord says, I give you, Ezra, the interpretation of the fourth beast. It is an eagle. So who's the fourth beast? The United States. The United States. Now, in who's the controlling beast in the last days, according to Revelation chapter 12? The eagle. It's the dragon. So it's not the eagle, it's the dragon. And... Joseph Smith will say in the Doctrine and Covenants, ye know not the hearts of men in your own lands. And he'll talk about how the enemy is combined. So you have a bear, a, a lion, a leopard, and an eagle, and a dragon, and they are all combined in the dragon. And Joseph says that, the enemy is combined. So... As you, as you move into the book of Revelation and you see the beast rise up, which doesn't happen in Revelation 12. It happens sometime after the fourth beast rises up in Ezra, because now the enemy's combined. And you know, if, you, if, if I were to take my guess, it's 2017. When we see the sign of the woman, then the, the dragon in Revelation 13 rises up and who get and he overcomes the saints by 2022 and um, he all of us have the mark of the beast right you think you don't you don't agree with the book of revelation he causeth all small and great rich and poor free and bond to receive the mark and you know that because you can buy and sell 
The mark is for the purpose of making sure that you have the right to buy and sell in the great core of all the earth. So if you can buy and sell, congratulations, you got the mark. And the point of this is not that you should shame yourself for having the mark. The warning is to get the mark off you so that your society will not accept you as one who can buy and sell. And that's painful because I'm still buying and selling. Do you make anything of when he says, here is the patience and the faith of the saints? Yeah, if you take up the sword in retaliation for the sword coming upon you, you are violating the law of war with God. And in this day, God says, you are not allowed to pick up the sword. And if you do, you will die by the sword. But the consequence of that is all those who are waging war of the sword will be destroyed by the Lord because they'll fall into the pit that they dig for themselves. Because the commandment is to get out. Is there a correlation with that? With uh, So you said, for instance, the watchman <clears throat> needs to protect and do that. So it sounds like you don't see that as a physical or at least a violent protection. And then... Do you have any thoughts then on when there's the prophecy that the West Coast will be overcome and that the United States will say we will look to the mountains of the boys who have prophecy and the basically the boys out of the mountains will come and save them? Yeah. So hey. both of those sound kind of violent, so that's kind of... Talking about a willingness to let go of, of Babylon's commerce at a basic yeah. level, right? Is that really... Like Joseph Smith actually said it. He said the church and the people would have to become independent of all others. I would highly recommend the book called The Second Coming of the Lord by Gerald Lund. It is the best primer I've ever read on for the average Latter-day Saint. And he has wonderful quotes by prophets and apostles about preparing. And one of them is by Joseph F. Smith. And Joseph F. Smith says, I see us going back as we came without modern conveniences, as a group of people fighting enemies on our left and on our right. Which brings up the sword concept. The only time the Lord justifies the use of the sword is in defense of the church, family, and property. So once the attack comes on the way to deliver the woman to her place, then the men of Israel can protect her. At what point along that path is she attached I would guess the whole way I think that is actually the purpose of the Gog and Magog of America can you elaborate on the Gog and Magog I've never even heard of that I don't know what you're talking about okay so if you go to Ezekiel I, how much? oh we're past oh we gotta go we're a half an hour I'll past you don't worry. okay yeah you bet so sorry we gotta we have a we have an evacuation